Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, November 17th meeting of the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management. I think we have, looking around, looks like we have quorum. Um, I guess we'll do just, just to be safe. Chris, I'll let you do a roll call. Mr. Brockington. Good morning. Councilor Cloutier. Good morning, all. Councilor DeRuz. Good morning, everyone. Councilor Eglai. Hi, good morning. Councilor Hubley. Uh, uh, here. Councilor King. Good morning. Councilor McKinney. Good morning. Vice Chairman Art. Hi, everyone. And Chair Moffat. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone attending virtually this morning. So we have a number of items on today's agenda, uh, but just some clerical stuff first. So declarations of interest. Does anybody have a 38 centimeter tree in their front yard that they want to cut down? No, we're good. Okay, perfect. Um, confirmation of minutes of the meeting of Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Okay. So, so item number one is our our budget for tax and rate. So we will hold that with presentation, of course, and delegations. Item number two is the financial statements for in-house solid waste collection, our external audit results for 2020. Now we don't have <clears throat> any speakers. Not sure if we have uh, anyone wishing to speak to that or hold it to ask questions. Anyone in that item? Can we then receive that report? Received. 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 All right, thank you so much. So item number three is funding cost-effective energy evolution projects. We have a speaker on that one. Uh, hold that. We have a speaker on number four, which is divestment from fossil fuels and increase in sustainable assets. Actually, it's, it's like... Uh, it's Angela Keller Herzog on, on all of them. So it's, she's like a special guest. If we had like a cool 80s theme at the end, it would be featuring special guest, Angela Keller Herzog. And so hold that. And item five is um, some administrative updates. Uh, nothing untoward, but some administrative updates on the uh, new tree protection bylaw. Up until last night, we had no speakers or correspondence, but unfortunately some Misinformation was spread through a, uh, a singular community. Uh, so that has stemmed to a delegation and a number of correspondence uh, based on misinformation. But so we'll address that and get to that when the time comes. Um, and then item number six, status update on standing committee, uh, this committee uh, for inquiries and motions for the period ending 5th of November, 2020. Uh, is that item received? received? Received. Received. Thank you very much. All right, so we will go back to item number one, which is the budget. Chair, if I could just interrupt, item two has to be carried, I believe, because it's recommending that council receive the report oh. for information. Yes, good point. Carried. 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 That was, geez, that was, imagine if it didn't carry after, holy geez. But we're okay, we're okay, Chris, everything's fine. Okay, perfect, so back to number one. <clears throat> so on the budget, carried. Oh, no, no, sorry. Presentation <laughs> speakers. Presentation and speakers. My apologies. Good. Good. All right, so I see we have Shelly McDonald here. Good morning. Good morning. You have five minutes. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. That looks great. All right. Good morning to the members of the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. My name is Shelley McDonald and I'm the Acting Director of Solid Waste Services. And I'm pleased to be with you here today to deliver the draft 2021 budget. I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will be presenting with me today. Isabel Jasmine, the Deputy City Treasurer is here on behalf of Finance and Karina Duclo, Acting Director of Infrastructure Services is here on behalf of Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Megan, Mich Megan Mitchie, Lynn Lowe, and Brian, Brian Fleshhacker for supporting the development of today's presentation. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Great. The focus of today's presentation will be to review the tax operating and capital budgets and to review the rate supported operating and capital budgets as they pertain to the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. Next slide. And I'll hand it over, I think, to Isabel Jasmine. Thank you. So uh, I'll, yeah, I'll just move to the next slide right away. So this slide provides an overview of the proposed budget for these four tax supported service areas. Infrastructure services in, is increasing by 395,000 over the previous year. This is an increase of 630,000 in, expendi in expenditures offset by an additional 235,000 in rec recoveries primarily from capital projects. Resiliency and natural systems policy is increasing expenditures by 157,000, which is offset by an increase in recoveries, primarily from user fee revenues for a net increase of 37,000. Solid waste services expenditures are increasing by 8.66 million, which is offset by an additional 4.9 million, primarily from an increase in the garbage fee and other user fees. And the net increase is 3.7 million. Forestry services expenditures are increasing by 680, 5,000, which is offset by 380,000 tree permit revenues for a net increase of 305,000. There is no estimated increase or impact from COVID expected for these services in 2021. Next slide, please. The budget includes an adjustment for potential 2021 cost of living increases, increments and benefit adjustments. It also includes inflationary and growth increases to the curbside and multi-residential collection contracts for garbage, recycling, and green bin programs. There are planned capital projects required at the landfill and associated facilities, and this requires a 2021 increase of $4 per household. Next slide, please. As outlined in the approved report to Council in April 2019, the user fees for waste collection are increasing in 2021. The city's competitive procurement process has ensured that residents and property managers are receiving good value for their tax dollars. When the capital requirements for the landfill and facilities are added, the total user fee for curbside residents is increasing by 83 cents more per month or an annual increase of $10. For multi-residential property owners, including both the contract elements and the capital elements, there's a unit user fee increase of $1.25 per month or an annual increase of $15. Next slide, please. Here is an overview of the tax funded capital budget, which includes $19.914 million that are earmarked for solid waste assets, initiatives and regulatory projects, which would come from the capital reserve fund and revenue, including 6.9 million to complete the stage two capping of the trail road landfill, 8.664 million for the first phase of construction of stage three capping of the landfill, 800,000 for the design of a leachate liner, 150,000 for the design and installation of a system to recirculate leachate, 250,000 to relocate the small loads area of the landfill, 950,000 for repairs and development of the trail waste facility, $1 million for the repair and expansion of the gas collection system, 1.2 million for the city's solid waste long-term planning capital projects, including the expansion of the recycling and parks pilot and funding to plan for the transition of the city's recycling program to individual producer responsibility. In addition, the budget includes $2 million for natural area acquisitions. The city receives several requests for rural land purchases each year. The official plan policies authorize the city to secure and conserve natural environment areas and other rural natural heritage system lands through a variety of means, including but not limited to management agreements, partnerships and acquisitions. Not included in this chart is an additional 2.6 million from the Hydro Ottawa dividend surplus that will be used to advance energy evolution projects to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, as part of the energy management investment strategy, 3 million is being added to the budget, which is going to facility enhancements and retrofits designed to reduce overall building energy intensity, energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions 
with an average eight year payback. Next slide, please. In order to accomplish the initiatives identified in the capital budget, the draft 2021 budget will draw 22.914 million from the capital reserve fund and 2 million from debt. I will now pass the lead to Isabel to start the discussion on the rate budget. Next slide. So the rate budget includes water, wastewater, and stormwater services, which are primarily funded by revenue from the water bill and stormwater charge. The various components of the water bill are increasing at different rates, but for the average urban property consuming 180 cubic meters of water a year, the overall average increase is 4.5% or $37 annually or $3.08 per month. For the average rural non-connected single family that does not get water bill and only pay the stormwater charge, the increase is $7 for the year or 58 cents per month. The rate increases are aligned with the operating and capital requirements in each service area. Next slide. Drinking water services expenditures are increasing by 5.2 million with offsetting revenues from user fees. This represents an increase of 2.7% expenditures overall. Wastewater services expenditures are increasing by 5.8 million with offsetting revenues from user fees of the same amount. This represents an increase of 3.4% in overall expenditures. Stormwater services expenditures are increasing by 6.6 .6 million with offsetting revenues from user fees. This represents an increase of 11.1% overall in expenditures. There is no estimated increase or impact from COVID expected for these services in 2021. The various components of the water bill are increasing at different rates. Oh, I already went through that. Thank you. That's it for that slide. Next slide. The budget includes an adjustment for potential 2021 cost of living increases, increments and benefit adjustments. The budget also includes an increase to the contribution to capital of 595,000 for water, 2.577 million for wastewater, and 5.309 million for stormwater. I will now pass the remainder of the presentation over to Karina. Next slide, please. Yes, good morning. The draft 2021 budget includes about 218 million of capital investments to renew and grow water wastewater and stormwater infrastructure that delivers essential services to residents, business, and visitors. The city water infrastructure continues to be in fair to good condition. For the last five years, the city has consistently achieved at least 98% rating from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks. The city is responsible for maintaining and renewing 9,000 kilometers of pipe two water purification plants, one wastewater treatment plant, about 100 pumping stations, six communal well systems, and over 6,000 culverts. All of the city infrastructure assets are safe. The total replacement value of these assets is nearly 18 billion, about half of the replacement value of all the city major infrastructure assets. Next slide, please. The city would invest about 218 million to renew and grow water infrastructure. This would be funded by reserves, 155.3 million, debt, 52.8 million, development charges, 9.7 million, and revenue, 250,000. Between 2021 and 2024, the city would invest 1.1 billion in renew, to renew and grow water infrastructure. 55.4 million for drinking water infrastructure includes 14.8 million to repair and replace water mains to ensure continuous supply of quality drinking water. 12.7 million to renew the two water purification plants including building a new phosphate treatment process and replacing upgrading equipment. 8.2 million 
to replace the Brittany Drive water pumping station that supports new development and improves reliability with construction that expected to start in the next spring and completed by the end of 2023. 4.3 million to establish a funding envelope to retrofit, rehabilitate and replace water pumping stations as they age. 3.5 million to maintain the water distribution system, including pipes, fire hydrants, valves and water meters. There is about 105 million in the budget for integrated road, water and wastewater infrastructure, 63.8 million falls under the transportation committee mandate. 18.2 million to renew integrated water and wastewater infrastructure, including 14 million to repair, rehabilitate and improve sewers. Next slide, please. Here are additional highlights of the 2021 draft budget in relation to stormwater and wastewater investments. 25.4 million for stormwater infrastructure, including 14.8 to repair and replace culverts, 6.5 million to repair and improve stormwater facilities, including ponds, catch basins, pipes, maintenance halls, outfalls, and pumping stations, and 3.5 million to repair creeks, rivers and ravines, stabilize slopes, and mitigate flooding. 55.1 million for wastewater and infrastructure will include 17.4 million to repair sewage pumping stations, 13.7 million to repair and extend the life of ROPEC, and 7.3 million to repair and improve sewers. Next slide, please. In order to accomplish the initiatives it identified in the capital budget, the budget would draw 155, 322 million from capital reserve fund, 50.922 uh, million from debt, 250,000 from revenue, and 11.487 million from development charges. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to just point out one one thing because I think it's something that we we don't do the best job at um, at communicating, and it's in both of those um, slides that show what we're spending from reserves. Uh, when you look at the big picture part of the budget, you see the two the two pie charts that show. $3.94 billion in, in spending and expenditures. We show reserves. We show that we're spending a significant amount of money in reserves. What we always forget to highlight is on the other side, which is the, the revenue side, um, there's a section that says capital formation costs. And in that is what we contribute to reserves every single, every single year. So actually at the end of this, at the end of the budget year, what we project is that the reserves at the city will actually go from $475 million to $492 million. So even though the presentation today makes it look like we're rating reserves and spending 200 million, that's how we front end the cost of the projects. And then we backfill it uh, later on. It's just, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a misconception. I think that we, we, we unfortunately presented in a way that we don't explain it properly. Um, but that's, that's I just noticed those are the two biggest pots on those, on those pie charts was reserve spending. Um, two, I think before we get to delegations, uh, which we'll go to uh, right away. Um, two is a, one of the key things of this term of council and, and, and one of the reasons that we had a discussion at the start of this term on the name of this committee was that um, don't look to this committee for all climate change initiatives. They belong everywhere and they, you will find them everywhere. You will find them in all of our budgets uh, across the city. Uh, this is not the be all end all committee uh, for spending on initiatives directed at climate change. Uh, you'll find in transportation budget, you'll find in the transit budget, these types of things uh, are, are everywhere. So I just wanted to make sure that's clear as well, that while we do have some of those initiatives, energy evolution obviously is, is an important one and why, it's why we worked so diligently to ensure that the, the dividend surplus money was, was protected and preserved for the purpose that we uh, highlighted it would be for. Um, but 
there is certainly other spending going on at the city this year, next and beyond uh, that will contribute towards our, our climate change initiatives and goals. Um, so just with those comments, uh, we will go to our list of speakers. And first up, we have Emma Bider. Eric, I'm just wondering if you wanted to introduce the roadmap motions at any point. Uh, well, let's just let's just run through the. I mean, the roadmap has no bearing on the on the delegations. Um, I don't think a single delegation is going to be like, well, now that I've seen that roadmap motion. Um, so we'll just go ahead and we'll go delegations, then we'll do the roadmap motion. Hi, thank you, Scott, uh, and thank you for uh, mentioning that climate change initiatives are sort of everywhere in the budget. I think that's important, but I think that also speaks to the some of the larger issues that uh, I, on behalf of uh, Horizon Ottawa, will be briefly mentioning. Um, so first off, I think it has to be said that any sort of climate change initiatives, regardless of where they are in the budget, have to be considered alongside Council's decision earlier this year to expand the urban boundary. Um, many of us know that this will increase urban sprawl, and it does push the city away farther from its carbon reduction goals. Um, and so my concern is that there is this a bit of a disconnect between what the city is proposing to do with the 2021 budget uh, and its climate change action plan. Um, there is no new money um, for climate change in the 2021 budget. There's a reannouncement of hydro surplus dividends from 2019 uh, that were released in May 2020. Uh, and there was a reannouncement of 3 million in city building energy efficiency investments that was also there in the 2020 budget, was then clawed back, mostly because of COVID mitigation, and now is back. There is no money uh, that I could see that was put towards climate justice initiatives. We know now that low income folks are adversely affected by climate change. Uh, according to Canada Without Poverty, there is a deep interconnection between poverty, income, housing, and climate change. And uh, all of those things have to be interconnected to deal with the, the current climate crisis. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that on June 8th, uh, the NCC and the City of Ottawa did release a climate projections report, uh, projecting shorter winters, more extreme heat events, and more precipitation generally. This report is meant to help inform a climate resiliency strategy, um, but where is the money for developing this strategy? Um, we have the information. So what are we doing with it this year? Furthermore, the city is supposed to be doing a vulnerability assessment um, with the help of OPH, which is, speaks right to your point, Scott. Um, but the, the problem is that the city has not given a budget increase to OPH while we're in a pandemic, <laughs> um, even though the OPH has a deficit. And I misspoke, sorry, the, it has given it a very minor budget increase, but compared to something like the Ottawa Police Services, it's negligible. Uh, we can't continue using terms like growth uh, if we want to make real changes that will mitigate climate change in Ottawa. Uh, we can't use the rhetoric of development and increased city growth. We can't think of our natural systems as mere resources that are tied to the city's economy. Uh, the language of this budget is oriented towards a business as usual approach. It doesn't take into account the ever changing, ever worsening climate crisis and the radical way we need to rethink how we understand our relationship to the city's environment. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say that in the climate change master plan, uh, one of the priorities is to mobilize the community. Uh, from my perspective, the community has already been pretty mobilized. Um, and I don't see any ways that the budget connects mobilization of community and connection with community to the city's current plans. Uh, and that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bider. I don't feel, let me just see my participants thing. Oh yeah, so Councillor Menard, question. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Emma, for being here. Um, I'm wondering uh, with regard to the, the funding of, of climate change initiatives, if you would be in favor of um, ensuring that we, because it's hard to find, it's hard to find funds in the budget. Uh, obviously, moving things around is what we we would like to do here and there where it makes sense. And uh, certainly, my 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 approach uh, to it on spending on certain areas. But another motion that we have later on today, I don't think you're speaking to it, but it is it is around borrowing so that we can actually re reduce uh, our operation costs and increase our uh, savings in the city uh, while reducing emissions. 
Uh, I'm just wondering what you what you think about that in terms of things like energy efficiency within our buildings, a, a shift on uh, how we uh, produce energy in the city um, through our solid waste systems, for example. Uh, if that's something you'd be in favor of, uh, is uh, uh, borrowing at low interest rates to produce uh, uh, income and uh, savings greater than uh, the cost. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Menard. Um, I don't know if I can really speak to great detail um, to that, but I would say that um, energy efficiencies, <clears throat> excuse me, in city buildings is very clearly part of the, like a big part of the city's plan. And um, I would say that my, my interest in that would be focused on um, whether that is going into like Ottawa public housing uh, infrastructure to ensure that there are energy efficiencies in those buildings. Um, and if that's like a specific target, um, I, so I, I would say that provisionally, given that I haven't had a chance to, to read up on that aspect, yes, um, but obviously with, with the caveat that I, that I would want to do more research before I give you a more concrete answer. Okay, well, thanks for being here and, and stay tuned because that motion is coming up today, if you're able to. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that, uh, Councilor Bernard and, and Ms. Bider. Thank you for being here today to speak. Um, so in her first of three appearances before us today, Angela Keller Herzog. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. So um, as introduced by the chair, um, my name is Angela Keller Herzog. Um, next slide, please. I'm speaking for CAFES, which is Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability, also well known to this committee. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our presentation today is entitled Searching for Climate Finance in Budget 2021. Next slide, please. Um, we'd like to remark that the context of this budget certainly is not a budget crisis. We are looking at a growth budget the province has been making us whole and interest rates are at an all time low, which favors um, that debt rolling over is costing us less and there's room for capital project debt financing with uh, while respecting conservative debt service ratio requirements. Next slide, please. Um, in our presentation, we'd like to raise two questions um, and I think Scott, your comment that we can't look to the councillors on the environment committee to do everything is well taken, but we do look to your leadership for identifying and helping us see that climate finance is found on budget 2021. And our second question is also to find the zero or low carbon investments. So that's what we'd like to unpack today a little bit more. Next slide, please. So the um, honorable mayor in his uh, draft budget speech told us that with a contribution of 2.6 million provided through the Hydro Ottawa dividend, 11 million will be provided to support energy evolution. And he also references leveraging federal and provincial funds and the goal to invest in positive return projects. Next slide, please. So as Emma has already referenced, um, the surplus hydro dividend of 2.6 million, it came from operating year to, uh, 2019, um, entered the city finances in about May with the audit completed, was briefly clawed back, was then returned. And then there was a detailed spending plan approved by this committee and council. So the conclusion of, uh, that we have is that that ship has sailed um, and that this money shouldn't be in budget 2021. Um, next slide, please. So then the question is, what about the surplus hydro, hydro dividend for 2021? Um, and I think this video isn't gonna work, but there's a video there of the um, CEO of Ottawa Hydro, Bryce Conrad, actually reporting to the city that there will not be a surplus um, dividend in 2021. Um, because COVID is taking its toll on them as well. Next slide, please. So the question then is where to find the mayor's energy evolution 11 million and where to find the municipal climate money that will be used as the counterpart funding to leverage the federal and provincial funds that we're all hoping, um, hoping for to get the thing going. 
So our best guess, and, and this is where we need your help, is that there's an 11 million capital project authority that will come into play when the detailed project descriptions for the 20 energy evolution projects are approved or when municipal counterpart funds are required for federal or provincial climate finance, that, that leveraging mechanism. Um, next slide, please. So then unpacking some more, we know from our emissions profile that we need to look for the transportation and building sector to be reducing emissions. So when we examine draft budget 2021 for the fleet vehicle and equipment plans, we see a spending plan for $23.2 million, which is not pocket change, 167 vehicles, zero of them are electric. We also know that the One electric minute. bus pilot, thank you, of 2020 has not proceeded and that building refurbishments, aside from the 3 million beam funding, um, are not giving us assurance that there are retrofits at all. Next slide, please. So we are not seeing a plan to build back better in budget 2021. We're seeing lots of money for road growth, not just pothole fixing, but road expansion, much less for active transportation. And we're seeing disincentives for riding public transit with a transit fare increase. Last slide, please. Um, we are therefore needing clarification on where the $11 million is, how to leverage. We need clear direction to staff to bring climate finance onto the, the budget. And it's our view that unfortunately so far budget 2021 is overwhelmingly a fossil fuel infrastructure budget that is locking us into the life cycle of new procurements um, for fossil fuel emissions. So what we need to do um, with your leadership is to embed carbon lenses onto council decisions, asset management planning and procurement. And I would also second what Emma said, climate and equity lenses need to be applied simultaneously, incentivizing public transit, energy retrofitting social housing and investing in urban canopy in low income neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Councilor Maynard. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Angela, can you just go back to your last slide there? Sure. You will save the planet slide. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Oh, and the one before that, sorry. Okay. It was the oh, you didn't mean uh, that one. Okay. So with, no, yeah. we, we do very much appreciate the work of this committee. And, and we realize that these cross-cutting challenges are, are tough, um, but um, it's, it's you guys or nobody. Yeah, in this city, this we definitely uh, are the ones who need to lead on this strategy. And so I appreciate you being here. Um, with regard to, um, just on your last point, the urban canopy and low-income neighborhoods, that's referring to the, the tree canopy, um, or is that what you're speaking to? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then on the 11 million, I'll uh, follow up with staff after your presentation, unless they want to answer it now, but I, I probably, we can do that during the discussion um, on uh, what that was indicating, whether it be uh, current staffing levels or something else. Um, Cause I, I know you've raised that and it's a, it's a good point to get clarification on. So yes. I, I took that directly from the mayor's budget address. Yeah, thank you for that. That is that is very very helpful. Um, <laughs> and then um, we'll speak to you later on on the other two uh, two motions. So I just want to thank you for being here. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think there's you know I, I think most of the people here realize that I'm a bit of a realist. I'm not going to lie to anyone. I mean, I think there's I think we know that the budgets uh, this term of council have not been. Uh, predominantly focused on climate change. Like we know that. Uh, I think the intent of this committee and the work that I've been trying to focus on and working with a uh, council and other members of, of this committee and council is to set council up for the long term. Um, the climate change master plan is a big piece of that, uh, how it feeds into the other documents that we have. Uh, the energy evolution uh, report that we approved last month at council, unanimously uh, at council last month. Um, that's another big piece of that setting up the stage for, for where we go. It's not just, uh, it's not going to happen overnight. 
you know, the, the points you raise about the budget money being spent on things that aren't necessarily uh, climate related, um, you're not wrong. You know, I think the climate lens, the equity lens, those come later, those come, I think in December, we put those in place. Um, so it's, it's to look at what we can do right now uh, to set the stage uh, to equip future councils to make the decisions that we're asking uh, to be made. And I, I recognize that will likely fall short in the short term, uh, but uh, the long term, I feel it will be much better off uh, based on the work of this, this committee and the, the councillors that are here today. So thank you for that. Our next speaker from Ecology Ottawa, Rob Burns. Good morning, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, having me here today. Um, so uh, I'll keep uh, things fairly brief to a certain extent. Uh, some of the others have gone over some of the points, uh, but I'll start on the tree uh, file. Um, again, you know, referring back to the mayor's statement, uh, the mayor says budget 2021 includes $1.5 million to plant 125,000 trees. That's great. Uh, that's a nice consistent number and a nice consistent level. Uh, we're also pleased on the tree file to hear that uh, there are three new uh, forestry positions uh, that will be in place to implement the new tree bylaw. Um, and as you uh, might know from our previous communications, we think the urban forest management plan is an excellent plan. And we understand that the tree protection bylaw is really vital for the future of our city. So we're encouraged around that. Um, you know, obviously I'm speaking to the budget and not into the intricacies on some of the other measures, uh, but just want to flag that, uh, you know, as will be discussed later today, we will be talking about different uh, levels of protection for trees, depending on where they are in the urban area, suburban versus uh, inner green belt. And that's a, that's a long-term concern. And, and the concern around budget is, is, is how can council step up and ensure that there's adequate funding uh, to protect trees to the same level citywide so that we don't fall behind and have a kind of a skewed canopy where you know all the, all the younger trees are in one area and all the older trees are in the other and, and there's, there's kind of uh, disparities in terms of the level of protection. So, so that's on the tree file. Uh, on, on the climate action file, I would echo uh, some of the concerns of the other uh, speakers. And it's more of questions, you know, uh, looking for that $11 million, I think, is, has been something that we've also tried to do independently. We haven't found it yet. Um, I don't know, but the intricacies of where the $2.6 million come from, it seems like Angela's analysis is, is probably the most plausible that, 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 that we've read so far you know, uh, in, in terms of which hydro dividend it comes from. But on the broader picture, there's a long-term concern about, you know, where are we getting money for these vital climate action projects, right? Is it from uh, a dividend that sometimes occurs and that is held by an arm's length agency of the city of Ottawa, or is it part of the city budget? And, and uh, uh, Chair, I, I take your words, uh, you know, I, 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 I take them well in the sense that, that, you know, there is an effort to, to kind of set us up for the long-term, absolutely, and, and, and commend you on that. Uh, concern, of course, is always every year matters. Uh, the, the emergency is now. Uh, the United Nations tells us we have 10 years to act to avoid climate catastrophe. Uh, from a realist lens, obviously, the city of Ottawa is not going to do it alone. But cities uh, really have a position, uh, an opportunity to lead. And so really uh, encourage the city of Ottawa to kind of um, step up and, and be more ambitious here. Uh, more broadly, too, just to remind uh, the committee, and, and taking the chair's notes off the top uh, in mind, you know, the, the, the kind of overall budget that energy evolution calls for is, is quite large, right? $621 million a year, obviously for multiple committees. Uh, so it's complex. It's not going to be a single line item in the environment committee budget that tells us whether or not we're meeting our commitments on climate action. And obviously energy evolution was approved only recently. But, you know, the question for this committee is, is how can we ensure that, that over the long term uh, and, and to a certain extent, the short term, that we're leveraging those pots of money from other jurisdictions, uh, that we're stepping up our game on climate change and leading from, from this committee. Um, and then also, I think, I think one tangible near-term step was just, is just to bake that regular energy evolution money into uh, the Environment Committee, Committee's budget so that it's not an extra uh, add-on that comes uh, whenever you know, the city is fortunate enough to be in a position to receive uh, hydro Ottawa dividends. So uh, I think as usual, you heard me say this before, we urge council to move faster and further on the climate file. It's an emergency, uh, time matters. Uh, and on the tree file, uh, we're, we're plotting ahead. So that's, that's good news. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Rob, as always, for your, your presence here and your cooperation and work with us. Uh, Councillor Menard. Thanks again, Chair, and uh, thank you, Rob, uh, for being here um, and your presentation. The, the one thing I wanted to raise with you is around um, the shifts necessary in the budget. Um, and I'm wondering if Ecology Ottawa has uh, something in, in the works that would, would show where shifts could take place. And it, it's not necessarily, um, you know, a bunch of new taxes or something, but the, the, the shifts within the budget, where we're spending now that should and could be switched to other areas that may lower emissions and save uh, funds. So I just, I wonder um, if there's something like that, or if you have ideas for us um, now or in the future um, to, to come back with, with a piece like that, because I think that would be helpful in terms of where we need to go next, you know, starting this year, next year, and, and in next term, uh, what that's going to look like. So is that something on your, on your radar? Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I mean, it's, it, you know, I think that it's a, it's a longstanding concern and you've heard, you know, I think I'm sure all the members of this committee have heard uh, members of, of the, the environmental kind of community, loosely speaking, talking about this, right? We, we see this ongoing investment in roads. We often see a justification for road growth and expansion projects using language that we know is simply untrue. The idea that it will somehow relieve congestion. I understand that every single councillor faces pressures from the constituents and, and groups like Ecology Ottawa need to do a better job to talk about the phenomenon of induced demand, which obviously makes the eyes glaze over as soon as you say it, uh, but it's so critical, right? Uh, suburban communities will not see their congestion relieved with new, ro new roads. And the day that this council acknowledges that and starts shifting the funds dramatically from the road budget to climate action will be a very important, uh, significant day on council. We're seeing other cities move in this direction. They're entertaining policies like road diets. They're, they're using congestion charges, um, uh, basically disincentivizing driving. And I understand that that's like kind of the third rail of municipal politics. Uh, but that's something that we'd like to see uh, the council move in the direction of. I know that there's already support among some members of council. I think the challenge is not so much, I mean, there's one thing to get leadership from councillors themselves, but also to work in the constituencies. College Ottawa will be happy to do that, do more outreach in suburban communities to talk about uh, that phenomenon and, and how our money can be better spent for the benefit of all Ottawans. Thanks very much for that. And I, I think it's important to, to raise that. And I mean, the more documentation we have on that in terms of specifics, as you know, road spending on the development charges, it's a complicated piece uh, that those those shift slowly as as it's perceived of what, what was used in previous years and how the development charges work. So that's all mixed up in that as well. But it's a it's a vitally important discussion, I think. And I think the chair is is right when he says we've set up a plan to really meaningfully shift the city and we have to we have to and we will follow with actions uh, on that on that plan we're starting uh, but that plan I think is a very good one and the, the chairs uh, and the community has led that and now we're at a point where we do need to see that shift so I, I appreciate you being here and, and keep pushing thank you thank you thanks I think you know one of the things just on that, um, one of the challenges you have, and, and Emma spoke to it earlier, is, is engaging the public. And, and she's right. A sector, a sector of the public is absolutely engaged. And we know that. It's yourself, it's Angela, it's Emma. They're here. That's not the sector of the public that we're trying to engage. It's that broader public. It's that it's, it's really the majority. They're out there and they aren't engaged in this. And unfortunately, um, what they believe, what they perceive is that it's it's a war on them it's 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 that that war on cars that we hear it's you know what you just said about disincentivizing driving that is a red flag for the majority and it's it's trying to balance that is that's what we try to do i think even in that energy evolution project uh, everything we did there was trying to balance that and 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 present a plan that can be accepted by the people as as a positive as a good which it is uh, but it's just about the messaging and sometimes we we get lost in that and we are our own worst enemies when it comes to messaging sometimes but appreciate, um, again, appreciate uh, all your efforts and, and being here today. Thank you. We do have a, a last speaker that, uh, that signed up. Uh, where's my list? Uh, Sarah Sloan. Thank you. And thank you very much for allowing me in as a, uh, as a late entry speaker. Um, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. And I want to commend um, everyone who's uh, spoken before. And I just want to 
reemphasize and echo what they've all had a chance to say. It's, it's very important. Um, I'm here today, I'm a family physician. I'm here to speak from the health perspective of climate change. And I'm not just representing myself here today. I have colleagues all across Ottawa who are extremely concerned about the climate emergency and the planetary health emergency that we are currently in, not just in Ottawa, but worldwide. We know that uh, Ottawa has declared a climate emergency. And from a international perspective, the World Health Organization has declared that climate uh, climate change is the greatest health threat facing the world in the 21st century. And it compels us as physicians to take action to uh, try to protect the health of, of those in our society, particularly those who cannot speak for themselves. The most vulnerable are children and generations to come, all of whom will be most affected by, by uh, climate change. So for me in my practice, I see people affected by climate change every day, extreme heat, Lyme disease, uh, mental health impacts from being displaced from extreme weather events, smoke. Uh, I worked in uh, Vancouver for a number of years and there's um, the impact of the wildfire smoke is, uh, you need to experience it yourself to believe it, the burning uh, through your chest, the induced asthma, the heart and stroke um, manifestations from, from that, the isolation of elders not, uh, not being able to leave their homes because they can't tolerate the air pollution outside their house, the worst air quality in the world. And this is not a problem of the West Coast. Those, those, that PM 2.5 is, is distributed across the entire country. We're all impacted by this in one way or another. So in terms of the health impacts of climate change, you, you heard me speak to air pollution. So this is wildfire. This is um, pollution from our industry. This is pollution from cars. And all of this increases asthma, uh, which can be life-threatening for many of our youngest, particularly when combined with extreme heat, which is another impact of climate change. Uh, it's, it, as mentioned, it leads to uh, increased heart attacks, increased stroke, uh, simply from air pollution alone. Um, you heard me speak to Lyme disease, and I don't need to tell anyone here how prevalent this is um, and, and how it's just impacting further. Displacement of populations, again, from wildfire, flooding, tornadoes, we've seen that here, and the mental health impacts that come from that. Um, internationally, as we see increased flooding, uh, drought, um, food insecurity, we do have civil strife, and, um, and, and, uh, and health, income, health outcomes are worsened as people are displaced away from their health infrastructure. Again, as mentioned, children are the most affected as they're people of colour, um, and Emma spoke to this earlier. The people who are most impacted by COVID are the same who are most impacted by extreme heat. Um, uh, um, food shortages, uh, and so on. So this is an issue of health as well as uh, social equity. And importantly, you know, I heard, um, you know, of course, COVID coming up a few times over and thinking that um, we're not going to be having COVID in our budgetary concerns for next year. But COVID-19 is not separate from climate, uh, from climate change. COVID-19 is a symptom of climate change. It is a zoonotic disease that has occurred specifically because we have uh, taken too much from nature. We have impacted nature so significantly that we are destroying habitat and forcing uh, people and animals into closer contact. And this is done through our intensive agriculture, through our extreme weather events, um, and through uh, inducing poverty, uh, as well as sending people, um, forcing them to, to access bushmeat, for example, as a, as a mean of nutrition. Without dramatic action now, we will be facing more frequent and recurrent pandemics. This will be the tip of our iceberg and none of us want to live in this, that is certain, right? But we've also seen that when faced with this health threat, with this, um, with this crisis, we have acted dramatically, cohesively together to prioritize health. We have shown that we are able to step up and make significant changes when our health is is threatened. And that is what we are looking at going forward. So the same level of action needs to be applied to addressing the underlying cause of, of COVID-19, climate change, our loss of biodiversity, our air pollution, our water pollution. And as mentioned already, every file needs to be prioritizing this. And this is our future. This is our children's future. We have not yet, we have already warmed our, our planet one degree. We have not the the emissions in our atmosphere have not um, uh, achieved their full warming potential. If we turn off all emissions at this point, we will still warm. 
We need, we need to recognize time. that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Minor, if I could just add one more item. I, I have, uh, you mentioned uh, how to get money. I can speak to the um, the economic impacts uh, very clearly of investing today in our health and the health savings uh, that can be accomplished by this. I can send that to you if you'd like. All right, uh, thanks. Well, Councillor Minard actually has, he's wanting to speak to you, so. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, please do send me that information. That's thank all, you. I, I would uh, appreciate getting that. And mm -hmm. um, thank you for, for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks. And you're, I mean, just to, just, to, just to clarify, you're not insinuating that um, that climate change led to COVID-19, but you're just saying that COVID-19 has sort of uh, highlighted some of the, the challenges and exacerbated the situation. Um, no, I am saying that our changing climate is contributing to increasing pandemics worldwide. Over the past three decades, we've had a, um, a dramatic increase in the number of zoonotic, so animal to human viruses that have been um, that have been uh, transferred. This includes Zika, Ebola, MERS, SARS, HIV, um, and now COVID-19. So our, our behaviors that drive climate change, let's put it that way, our behaviors that drive climate change contribute significantly to, this, to the opportunities that um, allow for Perfect transmission spread. of virus. Right. Yes, right. without, if our, if our um, natural world was in uh, in balance without the stressors at the intersection of human and animal life, we would not be seeing um, this level of, um, of increase in pandemics and we would be much better protected from future pandemics going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here today. Appreciate thank you. It. Okay. So that's, that is it for our speakers today. I will now, so before we go to questions to staff, uh, I will ask Councilor Menard to move the roadmap motion. So there's two motions, one on the tax supported budget, one on the rate supported budget. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And if that, I have them in my email here, I'm pulling up. If, can they be put on the screen so everyone can see them? Kind of monotonous motions, but they're what we need to do. Perfect, thank you. And if you can just scroll down, okay, that's great. So I'll, I'll move the motions onto the floor that the Standing Committee on uh, Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management recommends that Council sitting as Committee of the Whole approve the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management 2021 tax supported draft operating and capital budget as follows, infrastructure services, user fees, operating resource requirements, resiliency and natural systems policy operating resource requirement, solid waste services, uh, under the user fees and the operating resource requirements, forestry services, user fees, operating resource requirement, standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management, tax supported capital budget on page 14, individual projects listed on page 28, 29 environment and page 31, 36 solid waste. So if you can just scroll down. Or move to the next one if there is another one. Yeah, now it's just the rate one. Great, great support it. We're just bringing that up. Let's see here. The suspense is killing me. Just as a spoiler alert, it's structurally very similar to the one that was just read. There we go. Very little excitement. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I'll start this with the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection. Protection. Yeah. Water and Waste Management, what's the name, Scott? Recommend that Council, sitting as Committee of the Whole, approve the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management, 2021 rate supported draft operating and capital budgets as follows. One, drinking water services as follows, user fees, operating resource requirement. Two, wastewater services as follows, user fees, operating resource requirement. Stormwater services as follows, user fees, operating resource requirements. 
and four, that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management rate supported capital budget on pages 18 to 21, individual projects listed on pages 33 to 57, drinking water, 59 to 61, integrated water and wastewater, 63 to 82, stormwater, and 84 to 102, wastewater. Thank you. Okay, so obviously we will uh, read those again when it comes time to vote. Um, so to members of committee, if you wish to ask a question, uh, feel free to raise your your virtual blue hand. Um, Councillor Brockington. Thanks, Chair. I have more than one. Uh, first of all, to staff, um, thank you for the work that went into this. Uh, it's very challenging to be able to accurately predict in a worldwide pandemic what next year is going to look like. And maybe this uh, section of our budget is a little more stable than others, but I, I just want to start off by thanking staff for all the work that went into this. I have a couple high level questions and then I, I've got some very um, micro level questions in the budget itself. So the first is can staff verify the revenues that we obtain through water bill, um, the water bill rates, what are those revenues specifically directed to? So the water bill includes the three services, water, wastewater, and storm. Uh, previously, it was all in one uh, water, and then it was a sewer charge. Now they've actually been split out to the three services, and the revenues associated with those goes towards the operating costs of each of those services, debt servicing, and then capital contributions. So in the past, to justify a rate increase well above the rate of inflation, we have been told that there, uh, that these revenues exclusively go towards urgent at-risk projects. Uh, this justifies a rate increase of more than double the rate of inflation that they're going towards infrastructure renewal on projects that are red flagged. Is that the case or are we using revenues well above the rate of inflation for other non-urgent needs? Um, I can ask uh, Pai to answer to the types of projects, but in terms of um, the requirements, the requirements are higher on this one because it's an asset intensive service compared to all the other services in the city. And asset intensive services cost more. I mean, inflation, the costs to deliver those services are higher uh, typically. Okay, so I, I just wanna say, I go out in the public, I get a lot of grief that the water bill rates are at what they are. And they've been that for many years before and they're projected to be well above the rate of inflation going forward. So my understanding has always been, we have significant infrastructure challenges. The, the reason why we have the rates set the, the way they are is because we have to address high priority critical projects and that these revenues were not going towards anything else but the most critical infrastructure renewal. And that's all I want verification on. Mr. Chair, perhaps I can answer that question and build on what uh, Ms. Jasmine had said. So in infrastructure services, we prioritize the uh, rehabilitation works for all of the buried infrastructure every single year based on a risk management model. Uh, we measure both the number of fre and frequency of breaks in any particular area and with high frequency of breaks, you know, there's Low frequency of breaks, it's cheaper to go in and just do a repair, but if there's a high frequency of breaks, we go in and look at replacement. Uh, we also look at the age of the infrastructure in the area. So you'll notice in this budget, a very large amount of money goes into integrated renewal projects. And integrated renewal projects are where we're going and replacing the entire system of underground infrastructure. And we are just at that age of a city where our oldest water mains, some of which like the Elgin Street was over 100 years old, and we have ones mm -hmm. in the market that are well, uh, they do need life cycle replacement. And some of the infrastructure that was built in the rapid era of post-war growth wasn't built quite as durably as that early uh, city infrastructure was, and it needs replacement at the same time too. So we are spending a lot of money right now in renewing that asset, those assets, and uh, that's to ensure the integrity of the system because it's the backbone of, a, of, our, of our water supply and water management system. 
So are all critical red flagged infrastructure projects being addressed? Chair, I, I think it's fair to say in any given year, we take the money that's available to us from the long range financial plan and we prioritize that to the projects of the greatest need and also with other coordination opportunities. Do we have every dollar we would like? No, that's not uh, unfortunately where we're at, but uh, we certainly take what council has uh, allocated to us and, and prioritize them to the, the projects with the greatest need. Yeah, I and can- While we're maintaining yeah. a safe system and I want to reassure you, despite the fact I say we would could use more money, safety still is maintained in the system and that's the first top priority. Thank Sorry you. I can end up in jail and that's why every year I ask to make sure our infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, particularly for water, is being addressed. This is a major responsibility this committee has. I think just I just want to jump in on sorry on the on the on the tax thing though on that on that increase above inflation. You have to remember that in 2008, 2009, 2010 the water rate went up by 9%. We went up by 3.9% in 2010, which was kind of a fake thing that the council I was elected on did to make it look like we were making it lower. But then come 2011, 2012, 2013, we went by 9% and 8% every year. And we continued that until 2016 when we did the, the, the restructuring of the water rate, which made that fixed rate, that fixed aspect of it, yep. Yep. because that was the problem. That's what we weren't capturing was that fixed aspect of the cost um, because it's, there's an operating cost to this. And we were doing it entirely, our budget was structured entirely on consumption, which wasn't, wasn't manageable. Uh, so now, of course, we have this issue where we've increased quite significantly on low volume users. That will balance out over time, but the short-term impact is painful. And we know that, and we knew that when we approved it in 2016. I want to just make sure, are we addressing our high priority uh, infrastructure projects? And is that the revenues from the rate increase going to that staff say yes? I move on. I do want to move on to the landfill, completely different topic uh, for staff. Um, I just want to make sure and get staff to comment. I've been quite outspoken. I have no desire for the city to build another landfill 20, 22 years from now. What steps are we taking in this budget and in future budgets to make sure we are reducing waste that's going to landfill and we continue to invest in all other ways to divert away from the landfill? Good morning. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so as, as Council is well aware, we're continuing on uh, our solid waste master plan uh, initiative um, with phase two um, coming uh, to, Q, to this committee in Q2, sorry, Q1 of next year. Um, the investments that are, that are listed in, in this year's budget will help support uh, the, our existing asset in order to make sure that we're meeting our regulatory requirements. Um, through the, the master plan, there are a number of component projects, uh, multi-res diversion, uh, for example. Uh, and so since we started the, the, the new contract on multi-res, we've seen an increase in, in diversion um, and, and more of those properties taking on uh, green bins. And so we've seen a 6% increase uh, since June. Uh, so as the, the Solid Master Plan progress continues, uh, we are continuing with engaging with, um, with residents, uh, with multi-res properties, in order to see what we can do in order to make sure that uh, we maintain the landfill asset and uh, we extend its life. Very well. Can you talk to us, uh, Ms. McDonald, about revenues obtained from recyclables? What's the market been like in 2020? What do the estimates look like for 2021? Our glass, uh, metal, paper, Uh, yes, so in, in the budget, we tend to take a conservative approach when we're estimating our revenues because we know that the markets are quite volatile. So we typically take an average of the last five years in order to, uh, to set our budget. Uh, so right now we're targeting uh, $9 million um, primarily from those recyclable revenues. Um, and uh, and that, that way we're able then to, um, should there be shifts or adjustments in, in markets, then, then we're, we're more conservative in our approach. Um, I do say that our, the quality of our recyclables is quite high. Uh, so we tend to, to get the, the best possible uh, revenue uh, because our revenue stream is so clean. Okay, and but for 2021, you're just, you're saying it's stable, stable as she goes? Uh, yes, so we've taken, like I said, that, uh, that conservative approach, uh, taking that average. And, and so we're projecting 9 million. So chair, I, 
I have a number of questions. I don't want to hog the the time here. What am I looking at? I don't. Um, in fairness, I find it foolish to set a time limit on counselors in committee because you just come back on a list. So if you have questions, ask your questions. Okay, I'm I'm going to be mindful of the time. I see other speakers. So um, again, Ms. McDonald, sorry. I noticed on page nine of um, the first section of the budget, we talk about a charge for asbestos um, dropping off, I guess, at the landfill. Can you just talk to me how this is received, how it's treated? I was a little surprised to see this. Um, I consider it hazardous waste. Can you just talk to me about this? Uh, sure. So at a high level, um, uh, we, we do uh, receive advance notice when, when contractors are, are planning to bring asbestos into the landfill. That way we're able to, to work with our operations in order to um, uh, take all of the, the necessary health and safety provisions in order to, to place that material. Uh, there is a requirement for us to be engaging with the, uh, the ministry as well. So um, the cost of that uh, allow for uh, the additional time that uh, it takes an effort in order to to manage that material appropriately. Okay, so the cost is, ref it, that's cost recovery, correct? Yes. Okay, and I just, Chair, switch over to the water side. Um, looking at the projected revenues, page two of the water section, um, Last year, 2020, we budget 188 million, 2021, 194 million. That I think is reflective of the, the rate increase. Is staff not seeing an increased demand for water from households because more people are at home? And does the budget accurately estimate revenues factoring this in? I, I can respond, uh, Chair, in terms of what happened in 2020. So uh, yes, there was a higher consumption on the residential side, but there was a drop in the commercial side, especially uh, government buildings and so on and so forth. So uh, it's offset and we're actually tracking towards uh, our uh, forecast volumes. So the revenue line is a sum of household plus all other. Correct. Okay. And are they billed at a different rate? So they all, uh, the volumetric rate is the same for both. Uh, there's just different tiers. So higher volumes get a higher uh, rate. Okay. And then, yeah. And the last section chair is just on some projects in my ward. Can staff just talk to me about the Carlington Heights pumping station? This is the re reservoir under Carlington Hill. This was a infrastructure project identified the last term of council. It's been postponed a number of years. Are we, I'm looking at some design money in 2021 and some, some big money in future years. Is this project finally gonna get off the ground? Chair, just uh, we'll commit to the counselor. I'll get you a more detailed answer offline, but the short answer is if we are moving into the design stage, that is the essential step of getting everything started. And uh, we typically take a year to design and then it puts it into a tender ready position for future year, uh, we'll confirm the spend plan for future years and which years we'll be able to go to tender on. So I'll, I'll, I commit to do that offline. Counselor. Fair enough. And I'm not sure, Mr. Willis, if you can talk to me about culverts. There are on pages in the, in the mid seventies, the pages, number of dozens and dozens of culverts listed for work. Is this dredging the culvert or is this actual the infrastructure that goes under laneways replacement no. so we so don't i'm gonna have ms duclos uh, respond to that question if okay, you can we, we don't replace chair. we don't replace uh, culverts under laneways that's those are as per 2008 bylaw those are the property those are the owner sorry you're gonna <laughs> those are the responsibility of the uh of the property owner so those are just uh, road culverts and they're mostly um replacement of road culverts in predominantly the rural area but Karina can add, add to that. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor, I can I can answer to that. So yes, those are the typical uh, culvert replacement that we do under the road. So the budget uh, usually includes uh, money for design uh, for the culverts that we are going to replace next year, and money for construction for the culverts that have been designed the previous year. 
Um, and uh, to confirm what uh, the chair has said, we do not replace the culverts at the entrance of uh, homes. But the culverts in my ward, my ward does have culverts. We have, you know, 75 year old neighborhoods. Correct. Um, these are only under the road culverts that go from one side to the other? Yes, Councillor. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna park other questions for now, Chair, and yield the floor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Menard. All right, thanks very much, Chair. Um, just, I just have three quick questions, comments. Um, on the uh, presentation from one of the delegations, uh, Angela Keller Herzog mentioned um, $11 million in the mayor's budget speech for energy evolution. I'm just hoping staff, can you comment or clarify on, on that and, and what it was referring to? If it was a uh, total budget or staffing or something else, if, if you were able to, uh, to bring that up. Chair, I, I might be able to help here. The $11 million is um, an allocation to uh, to my department, to the uh, building engineering uh, group. Uh, it is, it serves, uh, it's, it's, it was originally approved as 3 million in each year of this term of council uh, and the, with a million dollars removed from the 2020 because of pandemic and the impact on being able to deliver projects uh, this year. Um, it serves in each year uh, to uh, deliver uh, about a hundred and between a hundred and a hundred and fifty uh, projects, everything from building automation uh, to conversion to LED lighting to mechanical upgrades to facilities to insulation, uh, window replacements at Glebe Community Center. Councillor, you're probably aware of, uh, was. Uh, in, Funded through through this same beam initiative, uh, so in the in the current budget there is uh, the 2021 budget there is three million dollars uh, set aside and uh, a, a significant list of projects to go against uh, against that list uh, as we complete 20 what what is left of the 2020 and 2019 list of projects. Okay, uh, thank you for um, helping to just clarify where where that uh, came from uh, with the with the beam group, and obviously we're going to need to in future years um, really start to think about uh, energy evolution and, and how we uh, uh, put those uh, pieces into action. Um, I, I the second question is around uh, the FTEs on the climate change team. Are these changing at all this year? Are they going up? Are they going down? Um, if someone can help answer that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, through the uh, count in the last uh, committee meeting when and council meeting when the uh, hydro dividend surplus was approved uh, for spending, there were a number of additional positions in our climate change group that were approved as term positions. Uh, we are not, uh, as a department, asking for any permanent uh, FTEs in any budget in any standing committee this year because of our fiscal situation, uh, but we did have additional term uh, positions approved in that. Uh, and I don't have it at the top of my head, but I know some of them were towards community uh, electric vehicle programs and other ones. I, I believe uh, I can confirm the number later, but I know there are more than there are at least two. There may be more than that. I just have to go okay. verify it. That's helpful. Thank you. I mean, I get at that because I think what we need to make sure is that we've got the capacity, the FTEs within the climate change team necessary to understand, to um, apply for, advocate for and capture significant new climate change uh, related funding streams, particularly at the federal level, uh, but also our, our friends at FCM and, and other provincial streams um, uh, and non-government uh, pieces as well. So that, that's really where my focus is uh, for a portion of that team. I know we do this on a number of levels within the municipality, but I think that team is uniquely positioned to help us in that regard. And so I just wanna make sure we've got the capacity there. On the, the last question, Chair, is around our uh, rate-supported budgets, our water and our, our stormwater, uh, our drinking water and our sewer surcharge uh, for sanitary stormwater. And, and I'm raising this, I, I think our municipality is actually lower than a lot of other cities and towns in terms of what we charge for these, these services. They have been going up quite a bit lately, uh, bringing us more in line. But 
one area, and I'm not talking about the total bill or anything like that. It's the it's the incentive to to save, and we've got categories of of up to six cubic meters. Then we go up to 25 uh, cubic meters, and then we we really jump. and And from that six to 25, it's a it's a doubling of the rate. And so I think it, it would be nice. What I'm trying to get at is for for individual folks, um, individual residents, the incentive to save um, water may be incentivized further by putting in another category between that six and that 25. That's a that's a larger jump. And then the, the bigger ones um, that I see there, the, the fees don't differentiate very much. They go up slightly, but that six to 25, it, it doubles uh, on the sewer and the uh, and the water um, drinking water piece. So I think it'd be nice to just start this conversation a little bit more. I've talked a couple of times uh, with finance about it, but just to keep it going around, is there a better way to incent um, reduction in water use for, for residents by tiering in a different way? Um, so I just put that out there. I don't know if it was a comment from staff or anything like that, but don't need a comment. I just wanted to raise it as a, a piece I'll, I'll be working on in the next little while. So uh, back to you, Chair. <laughs> Unless there is a comment from staff, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I can comment. Actually, we are um, planning next year to uh, come back with a long-range financial plan that revisits the rate structure. Uh, as part of the previous report, we committed uh, within the term of council to review the rate structure. Now that we've got two years under our belt, to see how it actually is working. Uh, we've got much better data to understand how we can structure it going forward. So that will be part of the LRFP review next year. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councilman Eric. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Appreciate that uh, update too. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Yes, Mr. President, and uh, thank you for uh, for the engagement. I think it's it's very helpful uh, with additional context to you allow in terms of the sharing of the meeting. Um, so I want to go in the, I have a number of, of questions, not too long ago, but in the rate, uh, in the rate budget on page 27 um, of the, uh, the large, uh, the, the full version, we have a, a reduction in wastewater billing expenses and a, a revenue, sorry. And I just wanted to understand, uh, is there a particular risk element here? Uh, what's, what's happened? Uh, for, 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 for those revenues to be reduced. So I, uh, Mr. Chair, I can, I, I can um, uh, look at it. And so in terms of the uh, overall revenues, we are expecting to come in uh, slightly lower. It's not a significant amount. Uh, it's also offset by reductions in expenditure. Um, and it was the shifting to the residential uh, versus the uh, commercial. And, and that relates to COVID, sort of folks staying at home? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that fully. So if I flush my toilet, there's there's a there's clean water that's in, which is a consumption component that's in the water bill, but then we don't calculate the amount that is flush. So I didn't understand how that, how that revenue is shifting. So wastewater is charged on the same basis. It's, and the, it's based on the assumption that whatever comes in goes out. Uh, and so we charge wastewater uh, based on the, the volume metrics uh, that we calculate from the water going in. Thanks for clarifying. We learn stuff every day. That's good. Uh, on the tax side, I, I'm curious. So on page three, we have road degradation fees. Um, it's it's really low. It's really low for something that has pretty significant impact. I, I don't know how colleagues feel, but I always get annoyed when it, it becomes a trip hazard on a sidewalk. It becomes a, a pothole on a street. Uh, so, you know, uh, Mr. Willis, uh, Court, and Rob McLaughlin are quite involved in the review. I'm, I'm happy that they're reviewing uh, that side of the business, but I'm curious to see where does the revenue out of that fund go? 
So chair, currently the, uh, that, that, those fees are actually under review right now. We, we did an initial stage of review in terms of road activity bylaw. We have a further stage coming in 2021 to council, which will have again a review of those fees. Uh, historically, those fees have, were much lower and raised very little money and basically funded the operations of inspections. Now that the fees have increased a little bit, we've for the first time turned money over to the asset management group for reinvestment in road infrastructure. And that was only possible this year because the in the last year. So more work to be done for sure. Uh, and certainly that's the intent of where it will go, but uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and the, uh, the goal for that, those changes would be to be implemented this coming year? The project was somewhat delayed because of the COVID emergency. Uh, we, we haven't been able to do some of the work on this because of other priorities, but uh, the goal is still to try to get this, this term of council to get an update on this. I'm hoping it can be done in 2021. If it drifts a bit into the, into the uh, following months, uh, that's still within this term, but uh, it's certainly a priority right now. Okay, appreciate that. Yeah, the, one of the things that hasn't stopped through COVID is construction. So it's important for us to, to keep on top of the uh, of uh, the damages that are that we undertake on in our infrastructure. Further down on page 13, um, same thing. So there's a tree fee, and I know that there's changes coming into the tree bylaw, the tree protection bylaw uh, in January, which is great. I think everyone's happy with that. But but I'm curious to understand where the, those, the funds for that pocket go. I, again, are they reinvested into the forestry department or they, do they go into the general revenue? So, Chair, I don't know if any of my colleagues from Public Works and Environmental Services are on the line. If they are, I will yield to them because this money goes into the forestry operations. I see Martha's on the call and she can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, right now, the, the fees that, as they are structured today are really cost recovery for our forestry operations related to this permitting activity. Uh, as we go into subsequent stages, uh, there are new uh, compensation uh, systems that are separate charges from that. Um, I'm going to let Martha fill in. She's, she understands this far better. <laughs> Thanks so much, Steve. Sorry, I waited there because I, I thought that maybe Luke was online to take some of these questions. But yeah, um, the, the uh, new application fees that will come into play as of January 1st when the new bylaw comes into effect, they will cost recover these three positions that you see for forestry. And those three positions are specifically to help implement the, the new bylaw. So those are the resources that we talked about sort of a year ago, pretty much, <laughs> um, of meeting for this bylaw, and those are right there in the budget and will be cost recovered. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, two more uh, final ones, and, and just again looking for clarification. So on page 22 uh, in the maintain services um, description, the second bullet reads as follows. In inflationary increase to curbside and multi-res garbage recycling and green bin collection contracts. Uh, my, my, so, you know, reading what I've, I've read so far, I sort of understand the, the, the pressure, but I just want to understand the impacts beyond 2021. To me, they're unclear. So uh, could you maybe elaborate on, on that uh, $6 million pressure and um, how, how that is expected uh, in coming years. So if, if you remember, we approved that three-year extension of our collection yeah. contracts. That's what this is. It's that it's that extended contract and that was renegotiated with with our with our internal group as well as our outside provider, which is now only Miller because waste management we moved on from. Uh, and then it's built in over the next two years. So you see that increase, you see that that increase again uh, next year because it it captures the increase in the in the contract year over year. Uh, to the next time that we would go out um, for new bids. Uh, Shelly can add more to that. Your next reference is 2021, or you're saying additionally in 2022? You'll see a similar increase in the 2022 budget based on what you're seeing in this budget. But Shelly can correct me if I'm wrong. So, so Chair, just to, to, to reframe just a little bit. So for the, the 2022 budget, uh, it'll be a CPI and, and growth increase only. So the more significant, as the Chair noted, is due to the uh, uh, the new contracts that were approved for that three-year extension in April of 2019. Um, so, 
we should be looking better in 2022 budget. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the clarification. And then my final one is on page 38. And uh, that refers to uh, the green fleet uh, segment. So can, can you refresh my mind? I understand that a year, number of years ago, we created a green fleet, which then the fleet services, when they purchase vehicles, would offset any other any additional expenses for the purchase of a vehicle or or SUV if it was a, a green goals. Is, is that still how that works? Or with the energy evolution, we've shifted the procurement uh, right into to the fleet group. I, I'm, I'm, I want to understand how how that's shifting. So Chair, again, if many of my colleagues from uh, Innovative Client Services are on the line, I'll yield, but I can't answer that question if they're not. Mary's on the line. There. I'm here and I'm unmuted now. Um, with uh, the Green Fleet Plan, uh, we've used up all the funds from past plans. We've been working with Energy Evolution and have some, secured some uh, money with them that we'll be working on for the immediate future. And we'll be bringing forward a new Green Fleet Plan in 2021 to build on what we've done in the past. Okay, uh, in your consideration for a Green Fleet, can we, can we sort of tie in those worlds? Because with the energy evolution, it's very clear that transportation and, and purchases of our own fleet is a, a big indicator of the, the GHG uh, and, and emission impact. So uh, how do you see that plan uh, take, take structure? Like, well, what are the frameworks? Is there a, a big shift happening uh, as I predict? Uh, sorry, what kind of shift are you saying? Well, it's just, I don't think we're buying, I, I've seen some successes, for example, in bylaw, uh, but I have not seen successes in public works or other groups uh, that use more heavy, heavier equipment. Um, how do we, how do we create that momentum in our procurement uh, for, for future fleet purposes to meet that? I, I think the committee chair was, was, um, was quite right earlier when he described the energy evolution where it, would, it anchors future decision making. And I see that as a fundamental one in how we purchase equipment. Um, and and I, 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 I'm not, I find the, the approach to create a green fleet fund um, to be quite, quite old in, in mindset. I think it needs to really sit in the, the full fleet to, uh, for acquisition and, and purchasing uh, purposes. Yes, good point. And we, I'm not sure that the next Green Fleet we're moving forward to in 2021 will look the same as the old ones. We've really turned a corner in the overall market as to what's becoming available. You can really see that in the last year of buying. We've, we increased, I think we brought in more than 50 vehicles last year that were hybrids or electric. There's a lot more available on the market and we're finally getting to the point that the, the world is tipping and we're getting options that will meet the operations of our services, which has always been a stumbling block. So it, the technology is just evolving so rapidly, we probably do need to adjust a little bit. So we have a more agile plan. Absolutely. So that's, that's where we're at now. And we do hope to come forward with something in 2021. And again, in the meantime, we're working with our partners in energy evolution. Okay, is that something that I could sort of forward a request when you're ready to come in? Uh, when you have something substantial to come and meet uh, so that I understand uh, what, the, what your plans are? Certainly. I appreciate that. Uh, that uh, that's it, Scott. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think on that, just back on that uh, that surcharge thing, I think the way it generally works is it's, I think if I'm be wrong, I think it's 117%. So the sewer surcharge is 117% of the consumption. It gets, it gets confusing when you go to a place like Richmond where they're only on sewer uh, predominantly and most of the village is on, on well, but it's well, but a sewer system that was installed back um, 50 years ago. Uh, and they actually have to factor in because you can't meter sewage. You actually have to do it based on an average. So it's kind of, you know, that, that's actually an area where 
you know, a large family like mine would get a benefit because it's done on an average family, whereas a single resident is paying a bit more because this is really the only way uh, to factor in how to charge for just sewer. Uh, the last thing you want to do is be metering your waste, I think. Um, so thanks, uh, Councillor Fleury. Uh, Councillor Egli. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, a quick comment and then a question. So uh, on, on the subject of wastewater, um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to make a quick comment wearing my Chair of Public Health hat and, and thank uh, the, the staff that might be on the line now uh, for the emerging role they're playing in the fight against COVID uh, in uh, providing uh, very helpful data uh, to the city. So I just wanted to, I know it's not budget related, but I want to take the opportunity as I figured uh, staff were likely on the line and it's, it's, it's a different approach to collecting data, but it's turning out to be a very helpful one. So I just wanted to express a thanks on behalf of OPH for that, uh, for that role that uh, the wastewater folks are playing. Um, I want to shift uh, focus uh, to some questions around trees. Um, Trees, of course, uh, are very important in my ward. They always have been, but have become much more so since the impact of the tornado uh, a number of years ago. And I'm just uh, wondering, I see Martha's on the line, uh, so perhaps she's the best one to answer the question. Going into uh, our, uh, our budget year for 2021, uh, what programs and how much money uh, is set aside for the planting of, of new trees uh, in the city? Hi, thanks, Councillor Eagle. I'm going to pass that one on to Public Works. So I think Luke Gagne is on the line. And so hopefully he can come on and talk to that one because that is uh, squarely in the Public Works Department. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chair. Um, We'll, I, I can certainly uh, I can certainly provide you with some uh, some offline uh, details on that counselor but um, the, uh, the the uh, I think Steve Willis alluded to the 2021 budget is around um, uh, the cost of living increases and whatnot and, and our, 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 our our fiscal uh, our fiscal issues around uh, 2021 but um, we'll continue to uh, have the, uh, the, the, uh, the same funding programs that we've had in the past. Uh, I can certainly I can certainly uh, take it offline with you and provide you some more details. What what could happen in uh, in Ward Nine? I, I well, it's not particularly in Ward Nine, but the but that breakdown would be would be nice as well. I just uh, wanted to make sure that with everything going on, that we haven't lost sight of the importance of of replanting uh, in the city, and wanted to make sure that those programs uh, were still available for people uh, like Trees and Trust to to apply and. Um, and again, Luke, if you can provide this offline, you can provide it now if you can, but if not offline, I'd like to also get a sense of, of not only the dollars, but what that, what that might translate into actual trees. So if we're spending X dollars, does that mean 50,000 trees are planted or 10,000 trees or whatever? If, if, if I could also get some clarification on that. And, and I'll, I'll tell you where the line of questioning came from. Uh, in the last week or so, there, of course, this is tree planting time, and uh, there have been a number of uh, trees planted uh, um, along Bellman, along uh, Craig Henry, Elveston, uh, areas that were quite hard hit by the tornado. And, and I can't tell you the, the number of positive comments, emails that I've received from the community, uh, seeing those trees going in and, and, and bring some new life to those areas. So. If we, I'm happy to talk about it offline, uh, Luke. Um, just reach out to my office and we'll set up a time, but I'd, I'd like to have that information to share. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Chair. We, we, uh, I, I can provide uh, Councillor Eagle with those details, and I'm sure uh, the rest of the community would be interested in that information. Uh, what we are on target, um, we, we, uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of partners, uh, conservation authorities. Um, uh, Tree Canada, our, our, our Green Acres program, uh, Scouts Canada will continue to plant trees. So all these programs are still in place and we'll still uh, continue to move forward with those. That's it, Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I mean, keep an eye on your inbox because every year we always get uh, updates, our tree planting update. Uh, Tracy Lee Schwetz is always uh, good to send us an update uh, per ward of where tree planting is carrying on in our, in our own wards. 
Uh, so thank you, Councillor Egleg. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Catherine McKenney. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick questions. Um, just want to clarify, um, following up on the uh, Green Fleet uh, procurement, um, I guess if I'm if I'm looking at uh, the budget here for fleet costs, you know, in forestry, solid waste, infrastructure services, natural systems, do do, th do, do those budget numbers take into account? Um, the probability of uh, electrifying most of our fleet, or is it still a, is it still business as usual until we uh, until we move forward with uh, with a new procurement policy? Uh, again, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor McKenney. The the question of what's in that um, the replacement plan, where we can hybridize, we are. Um, as part of regular business now. The electric or any greater cost will be part of that energy evolution partnership for this upcoming year. Um, some of the types of units we're replacing are ones that there are no green options at this time. However, we are looking always, always at what we can do to green and improve the long-term co total cost of ownership and the long-term uh, impact on the environment. So reduce those GHGs. Okay. And, and um, Mary, when do you expect uh, that we'll get to see the, uh, the new, you know, Green Fleet procurement plan slash policy? Yes, that will be 2021 at this time. Okay. But like Q2, like 2021 is, well, 2020 has been a long year. Um, I imagine 2021 will be as well. I, ex I expect in the first half of the year. Okay, okay. I look forward to that. Thank you. Um, and uh, my next question is around the urban forest management plan. Um, when I'm looking at the budget, I see a $157,000 increase. I, underst I understand that there's cost recovery, you know, for the three positions um, for the uh, tree bylaw um, that uh, is coming in um, into effect on January 1st, but I just wonder if you know what that what that increase will cover, and if staff uh, feel that that is sufficient for the work that's required uh, going for forward on uh, on the uh, urban forest management plan in uh, 2021. Yes, Martha. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so um, basically, as we said, this is the, the three positions that are in there are for the specifically for implementing the tree bylaw. And so it's the new, like it, it will um, cover the that decrease to 30 centimeters from the motion and, and all the items related to the new tree bylaw. Um, in terms of the urban forest management plan as a, as a bigger item, that really has that tree bylaw part of the urban forest management plan has been our focus right now, right? And so that's what we've that's what we've pushed forward. That was our sort of big request for this year. Um, we have a few more items that we're going to be working on once we get past this January first date um, uh, that are part of the first management period of the urban forest management plan. And um, we actually will be coming back to this committee next fall because we're coming to the end of the first management period. So we'll be reporting on where we are with everything we've been working on and where we plan to go um, into the second management period. Um, one of the big items that is still to be done that we'll be starting in the winter is uh, a look at our tree planting programs. And basically it's, thought, it's sort of like the tie together piece. So to tie together the canopy cover work that we've been doing the, the, the tree bylaw, of course, which stands on its own doing the tree protection thing. And, um, and with, uh, you know, new policies in the official plan around urban forests, how we can tie all that together and make sure that our um, tree planting programs are meeting what we need to be meeting. So we talked before about that idea of like uh, prioritizing tree planting and how we prioritize it and where we're doing it taking into account our, our canopy cover. That's the kind of work we're gonna be doing moving forward. And we'll be coming back to council with sort of a summary of what that is and essentially like how we plan to meet any new targets we may have into the future. So that is to come. And there, there may be something associated with that, but for now, this is what we've been focused on is the tree bylaw and this 
budget and uh, creating those new positions, which are cost recovered, of course, um, brings us to where we need to be to implement the tree bylaw. Chair, if I may briefly add to what Martha mm -hmm. said, another significant thing that's in the is in the Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development Department is we have a term position, which is a new position for us to have a forester focused on committee of adjustment applications. And I know Councillor Kavanaugh and Councillor Eglai and I've had long conversations about the need to put more effort into that particular area. Uh, so that is also a new addition and a very significant change in our operational approach. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't questioning whether you needed the money. I was asking whether it's enough. Um, I'm hearing right now that that you, you feel it is, and and I, I look forward to uh, to the update on the, the tree planting program. So thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Much appreciate, uh, Councillor Derues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple uh, couple question, but also a comment that I'm very happy to see. There is a lots of. Uh, work in the, Culver, uh, in the Culver department happening. And I know that uh, So George froze, such is life in rural Ottawa. He was so happy. I know he waited for so <laughs> long to ask his question, just to freeze the second he started talking. I feel bad for him. Um, that we created and, oh. and I know, so. <laughs> so we didn't get a word you said, oh, he's gone. Okay. Um, Back on line. Are you good? Can we hear you? No. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip, when you come back, if you can hear me, Maybe you can. If you, when you come back, turn your camera off and ask your question. I'm going to skip ahead to Councillor King for now. Thank you, Chair. And I, I, I have a brief question, but before I get to that, I'd really like to thank staff for all the hard work that they've uh, undertaken on this budget. Um, I just really wanted to confirm in, in, in terms of a project of my ward um, with staff um, in terms of the uh, Brittany Drive water uh, pumping station timelines. I just wanted to confirm uh, whether those timelines uh, have been or have not been negatively impacted uh, by the COVID-19 budget adjustments. I know in, in the summer I was advised by um, uh, the treasurer that uh, there would be capital deferments. Now the project is back on, on line. So I just wanted to, to know whether there was any negative uh, potential uh, impacts in terms of timeline and, and potentially cost. Chair, we're just verifying the information and we will again uh, commit to give the council more detailed information on the project schedule, but um, we looking through our information we have here that it, the project has not been affected. Uh, it was planned, it's on, it's on the budget, it's in the timeline we anticipate. I appreciate that. That was uh, the primary question I had, uh, especially since uh, that uh, pumping station will be serving uh, 10,000 new residents um, within within the ward, within the former uh, Rockcliffe uh, Air Force uh, base uh, in Byron. So I just wanted to ensure that uh, that that project was on schedule and and on point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor King. So I'll see if George is back. I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I will ask very quick. My question uh, just to staff concerning Shadow Ridge 2. Uh, I know that we have been setting aside money in the last few budget to making sure we have enough money for design and construction. I'm wondering if Karina or Shelly can give me a little update to making sure that we're still on a plan and on target for that project. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor, yes, Shadow Ridge, um... We, we are aware of the previous concerns with the water quality. Uh, we have a contractor doing testing right now. Um, we had to update, uh, upgrade the power supply. Um, once the study is completed, uh, we are hoping to have the scope defined and send it to design and construction for design in 2021 and construction in 2022. If the design can be completed earlier, we will start construction earlier. Thank, thank, thank you, Karina, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll keep my camera off in case you need me. 
Thanks, George. Appreciate that. Um, Councillor Brockington. We're not hearing because we don't have sound. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to um, okay. ask Ms. McDonald about um, the recycling or lack thereof in our city parks, an issue that's been raised for a few years now. And I know the waste management plan is, is coming back and this may be embedded in it. Um, what is the plan in 2021, particularly for our major parks like Muniz Bay? This was a great year uh, in that particular park for visits, obviously with COVID and limited options to do and, and the closure of the beach at Britannia. We had, when you remove the festivals, I think record numbers from all the years I've lived here. But what I saw consistently every weekend were garbage cans filled with recyclable material. What is the plan in 2021? And then I'll have a follow-up. Uh, great, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so happy to report uh, and as part of the, the budget presentation that we're planning to expand the Recycling and Parks program in 2021, looking to have up to 20 parks and one destination park. Um, so we will be uh, connecting with councillors in order to understand better from you um, what parks that you would like us to consider. Uh, so then that way we're able to put together a plan that that's going to uh, be um, well received uh, by, by the residents um, and, and wanting to make sure that we're, we're hitting on, on the areas that, that you feel are important. Um, so that, that is our approach for 2021. Um, as you as you know, uh, IPR uh, regulation, the draft regulations have, have come forward and that will cause uh, some changes uh, starting in, in 2023. Um, so we're wanting to use 2021 as further data gathering and information in order to help support uh, the Solid Waste Master Plan, which will come back with a, a more formal approach for recycling in parks. Uh, but we didn't want to do nothing in 2021, so we have uh, endeavor to, to put forward a, an extension of our parks pilot, including that destination park. Can we commit to speak before we go to council just on what the plan is in my ward? Because if, if Booney's Bay is not included, I want to talk to you about what I can do within the budget to bring something to council. But can we, can we just make that commitment to chat? Absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. We'll endeavor you, to speak with you. Thank you. Can you also talk to whether the city's open to letting community groups who want to take on recycling in parks that don't have the facilities there to do it themselves? Meaning people have approached me and said, listen, we are willing to put our gloves on and literally go through the garbage and extract recyclables, which either they want to recycle or they know they could have value if they bring them over to Gatineau. But is the city open to that or is COVID throwing a monkey wrench in us endorsing such a plan? That's a very interesting uh, proposal. I'd like to discuss that with you further offline. I, I think there are probably lots of elements that uh, I, I just, I wanna make sure that I uh, understand fully and then can come back uh, with a, um, an appropriate response. So we can speak to that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm very keen for us to stop <laughs> Um, having recyclables go into the trash, you know, in all parks, let alone these bigger parks that I have in my ward. There's just the quantity is so big. And to work with staff on, I understand the logistics. I completely understand the logistic challenges of, of um, collecting this and making sure it's sorted. But Mr. Chair, as I've said before, it's 2020 and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing a plan from staff fairly soon. So I'll connect in that regard. So thank you for uh, allowing me to ask a question again. Thank you. So if I heard that correctly, that's 20 parks plus one regional park. That's 21 parks, 23 wards. When does the Hunger Games begin? So we endeavor to over deliver on a commitment. Okay, that'll, that'll solve the problem. And it'll, you know, resolve the whole requirement for the Hunger Games Ottawa edition. Um, okay, thank you. So thank you to everyone in council. Thank you to um, uh, staff. So we'll just run through the... Okay, so council seminar already read all the, the full, uh, the, two, the two robot motions. Does anyone actually want to hive off any piece 
of the roadmap, or are you okay with just carrying the two motions as they are? All together. Okay. So I'll just read them quickly just for the sake of it. Uh, so that standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management recommends that council sitting as the committee of the whole approve the standing committee on environmental protection, water and waste management, 2021 tax supported draft operating and capital budgets as follows. One infrastructure services, user fees, operating resource requirement, two resilience and natural systems policy and operating resource requirement. Uh, three, solid waste services, user fees, and operating resource requirements. Four, forestry services, operating resource requirements, and user fees. And five, standing committee on Pre environment protection, water, and waste management, tax-supported capital budget on page 14, individual project listed page 28 to 29, and pages 31 to 36. Is that motion carried? Carried. 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 Thank you. And on the rate supported that the standing committee on environment protection, water and waste management recommends that council sitting as committee of the whole approve the standing committee on environment protection, water and waste management, 21, 20, 2021 rate supported kit draft operating and capital budget as follows. One drink water services as follows user fees, operating resource requirement Two wastewater services as follows user fees, operating resource requirement three stormwater services, user fees, operating resource requirement Four that the standing committee on environment protection, water and waste management rate supported capital budget on pages 18 to 21, individual project listed on pages 33 to 57, drinking water, 59 to 61, integrated water and waste water, 63 to 82, storm water, and 84 to 102, wastewater. Is that item carried? Carried. 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 Thank you. So that is it for item number one. Item number three is funding cost-effective energy evolutions, energy evolution projects. So this is an item that came from uh, Councillor Bernard. We have two reports here um, that stem from uh, notice of motion from Councillor Bernard. So uh, it's the idea of you know, looking at opportunities to fund energy evolution projects in the future that would, um, that would help the city long-term uh, finding up, I mean, I, th I think the, the the best example in the past, of course, is the LED lighting, something that we went invested in, uh, put money in, working working with a partner, which is Energy Ottawa now, um, and Varia, I believe, is, is the name they go by now, um, on replacing the lights and seeing that return investment. So it'd be the similar similar idea to this. Look at the, looking for those opportunities. Uh, so we have a delegation on this, um, Angela Keller Herzog, and then I'll allow uh, Councilor Menard to speak to it as well. Go ahead, Angela. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. All right. Um, first of all, I would like to take a small issue with your comment earlier, Chair Moffat, about just you three people and this ironic tone on special guest status. The comments, I think, are not well taken. And behind our delegation stand a lot of people, a lot of volunteer time and represent hundreds of hours of work and expertise in terms of trying to understand the budget and some of these specialized climate finance issues. Um, it's our, the presentation that I'm bringing to this committee represents the work of dozens of people in community associations and hundreds of hours of expertise. Um, I hear your comment and I'm wondering if you would like to see new forms of public engagement that maybe you feel would be more effective. In terms so just of to be just to just before you get in, I mean that's not at all what I was referring to. I was, you know, I enjoy your presence at this committee, and I enjoy the fact that you take the time all the time to come out to this committee and speak. And I know that you speak on behalf of uh, the group that you represent, which is a myriad of community associations uh, focusing on and environmental sustainability. I fully recognize that. I was just having fun in the situation that uh, that we we have you here with us, and for these three items of of the five, that's merely all it was. And I. I, I think, you know, Rob, I have a good relationship with Rob and yourself. We talk um, outside of committee as well. And certainly no, um, you know, never, never mistake my, my um, addition of levity as anything uh, meant to minimize any situation whatsoever that we have here in front of us at committee. Okay. So a special letter writing campaign is not called for. Um. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> that'd be great. All righty. Okay, so let the clock start. Um, speaking to the motion regarding funding of cost-effective energy evolution projects, I am speaking in favor of the motion and I have uh, three observations. Um, first of all, now is an excellent time to invest in capital projects. 
As you have heard, the majority of climate projects proposed by energy evolution has a positive return. And some of these returns over the longer term is like is multi multi year and the city has access to very low cost finance at this time. So if you're borrowing in 2021 for half a percent and compared to borrowing say two years down the road for 1%, if you lock in today's rates that debt service cost will be half. Um, so very much um, welcome. Um, the second point is that um, the energy evolution plan calls for a city contribution of $7 billion to the financing of the energy transition. So we most certainly need a long range financial plan. Um, our recommendation is that there should be a separate chapter of the long range financial plan for climate investment. And that um, the, the same way that there is for the transit um, chapter. Um, the third point is that we would like to share the observation that the city of Ottawa is lacking a financial vehicle for climate finance. Um, it's clear that an asset of the city is our capacity on the human resources side, where we've seen very prudent and innovative financial management. On the financial side, the city is able to borrow. The city is also able to lend, and we have the proposal for the Better Home Energy Retrofit Program. And the city is also able to blend financing from in terms of grants and loans from other levels of government. Um, but we don't have an office or an institution, a setup, a structure to do all these things for climate finance. So something to think about for the city of Ottawa would be to have to create a vehicle to execute climate finance. So it's our recommendation that the city of Ottawa set up a climate capital corporation to perform these functions for the cost-effective financing of energy evolution projects. All right, thank you for that um, suggestion. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we've considered uh, something like that uh, per se, but it's certainly something that I'm um, happy to speak to staff about, and I'm sure other members of committee will We'll look into that same situation. Often we try to work with uh, with with existing partners, like like the situation of Envari, um, a partner that's fully equipped to be able to um, to undertake certain initiatives on our behalf. Actually, I know councillors uh, Blay and Harder had tried to work with with Envari on a on a massive uh, retrofit project as well, which I think is still kind of in the in the mix, but debating as to whether or not uh, the city undertakes it or Envari undertakes it. Um, Vari is well equipped to do these types of things, and we 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 fully aware. And I know Council Menard is aware of that as well. Uh, but thank you for taking the time to come and speak on this. I don't think we have any specific questions for you uh, on this on this uh, specific item. But I will have um, Council Menard speak to the item and the genesis of it uh, before coming here. So thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. So Council Menard, do you want to? I mean, I probably should have asked you to kind of intro it before we went to delegations, but I figured um, I'd give you that opportunity now. Thanks, Chair. And I, if you want me to read it, I can. It, it, it's long, but uh, I'll just intro it for now and you tell me what, what you'd like after that. But um, essentially, I, I want to thank um, uh, city staff, so climate change team, uh, Isabel Jasmine in particular from, from Treasury, um, for helping to, to draft this. We went back and forth on, uh, on how this could work and I think have a good motion in front of us now. It formalizes some of the possibilities um, that are being referenced uh, in energy evolution and would provide more explicit direction from, from this committee to FEDCO and, and council. Um, we need to be creative and flexible in terms of funding. Obviously this is a large plan. It's not all city-based. There's a lot of other orders of government that have to do this, but we have a, a, a role to play in all of this. And uh, we're counting on, on other orders of government, but it makes sense to do what we can on the municipal side. And so in looking at the, the interest rate environment, Right now, uh, the opportunity to invest upfront uh, for long-term or short-term savings and returns is, is what this is all about. Um, some of the examples are our municipal building retrofits. They, they pay for themselves. There used to be a five-year return. I think now we're at an eight-year return. Um, significant amounts of, of uh, GHG reduction, emission reduction. Uh, other projects that generate revenue like selling waste heat um, uh, from sewage. These are the sorts of things that um, we would look at. And there's a number of other examples that um, the, uh, the energy evolution team, climate change team has, has come up with. Uh, so it makes sense if, if we're gonna see savings as a city, 
over time uh, to, to look at low interest borrowing to achieve greater savings in that borrowing costs. It's, uh, it's, it's rare in, I think, a municipality where, um, you know, you invest and it pays you back. It's not just a, a service output, but there's a payback. And that's what we're, we're speaking about here today, those items that can pay back while also uh, lowering our emissions. So I think with that, Chair, I'll, I'll uh, send it back to you. If you want me to read the individual, therefore, be it resolved, I can do that. Um, but to open to your, your comment. Uh, thanks. No, what I'll do is I'll just, um, I'll just read the report recommendations and then we'll vote on, on that. And, uh, anyone else have any questions or comments that they want to, uh, Councilor Cloutier. Thank you, chair. And, uh, thank you very much. Just have a, a quick question for, I guess it's for finance staff. Can you just speak of the implications of, uh, raising that debt limit? Would it have any impact, um, on the, um, on our AAA credit rating that we currently enjoy? Um, so we have room uh, from a credit rating perspective. The impact is on our annual debt servicing costs. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, it's important to line it up with the overall long range financial plan because it's an affordability issue. We can increase debt, but it has an impact on our annual debt servicing and it has to fit into the overall framework in terms of what is affordable. And if I might add to that, Councillor, um, just in terms of our overall rating with the credit agencies, uh, there could be an impact on that in the long term with the raising of those thresholds. So just, just to put a little bit of more context around that. And when would we see those impacts? And, and what would the dollar impact be on our, uh, on our, uh, on our budget? Uh, just, to, just to be clear, just to jump in, the, what's in front of us is asking us to direct was pretty much directing staff to consider the affordability of raising the debt ceiling. Uh, we aren't today asking council to raise the debt ceiling. Whatever decision we make from this report from Councilor Menard on both one and two will result in the coming back to us uh, to discuss further before we implement anything. We aren't making decisions today that will impact uh, the debt ceiling or the credit rating. Noted, thank you, Chair. Did you, though, have a, did you, though, still need an answer on that last thing? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I've, I've okay. noted your comment. Uh, I'm sure that's what um, the Treasurer would have said, so uh, in, in her answer. Uh, so. Well, she certainly would have said it after I said it. No, I'm just right. Um, All right, thank you, uh, Councillor. Thank you. Wendy, did you want to? If, if I may, um, Chair, just to add to that, I think um, in terms of, of what's being asked here today, um, Councillor Cloutier is, is some work that we're doing already, and quite frankly, work that we're doing more holistically across the city, so not just related to energy evolution um, and dealing with sort of that um, financial piece and answering that question. We're um, endeavoring to review a number of our long range financial plans and you're going to see them come back over the next year or so. So this is really a, a bigger picture item where we will come back and we will provide some advice to you in terms of what this looks like, what those impacts may be. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let, like uh, Councilor Brockington said earlier, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you and your staff in the preparation of this budget and um, in all the other budgets that we'll be considering uh, between now and December. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cloutier. So in my, in my haste, I didn't update my speakers list from a previous one I was working on. We do have a second speaker on this. Uh, so I'm just going to jump them right into there uh, in between councillors. And we'll go to uh, David Wilson with the Ottawa South Eco Action Network. Wait, uh, there he is. Uh, Mr. Chair and councillors, uh, I am speaking on behalf of OCEAN, the Ottawa South Eco Action Network. Uh, we serve the federal and provincial ridings of Ottawa South, and we encompass the wards of uh, River, Alta Vista and Gloucester South, and a small piece of Gavel Ward. And I saw uh, Councillor Deans earlier in the, the, uh, the Zoom meeting. Uh, so we have uh, all four of our uh, representatives uh, 
at the virtual table today. Our grassroots uh, group promotes uh, local awareness about environmental issues such as promoting efficiency, waste diversion, and recycling. Uh, personally, I have uh, participated in the energy evolution working groups on buildings and energy storage. I believe that the city has done a thorough job of analyzing the GHG situation and coming up with a plan to attack the greatest problem of our lifetimes. It is indeed an emergency even greater than the pandemic. The only problem is, will it be funded? As many Canadian and international advocates have pushed governments to build back better, we as a city can take advantage of the funding flowing to pandemic relief to do just that. As has been mentioned, the Hydro Ottawa surplus is not a short thing during these times and the city needs to provide solid, stable funding for energy evolution projects. Only if we are seriously in the game will significant funds flow from other levels of government and there are a lot of funds available. Ostia knows that people must change to combat the climate crisis, and we are ready to help the city. We and other community groups represented here today can help the city with advocacy. Several of the energy evolution projects detailed in the documents submitted come under advocacy, but do not have a price tag. Ostia is willing to take the city's messaging on residential building uh, retrofits to the grassroots level but some minimal funding will be required for websites, videos, etc. Um, one of the major conclusions of energy evolution was that both commercial and residential buildings would have to switch from natural gas to heat pumps to reach the GHD targets. The feds are starting big with big dollars for big projects and big organizations. However, the toughest nut to crack will be retrofitting the 85% of residential buildings that will still be around in 2050. Oceana started to look at how to make heat pumps desirable for homeowners. This is also a big problem, but it has to start with a grassroots desire to take up the only currently viable solution, heat pumps for heating and cooling. The city needs to talk about energy ocean a lot more, just as much as they do on COVID, and we are willing to help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Appreciate um, you being here today and speaking. Um, I know I have a couple of counselors that are ready to speak to the report itself. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Mr. Wilson? Um, seeing none, I just want to thank you again. Sorry for the delay in getting to you, but appreciate you coming here today. All right, back to our list, uh, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as we know, Ontario municipalities uh, traditionally do fund their investments from property taxes, uh, user fees, and transfers from uh, higher levels of government. Uh, but these sources, as we know, uh, will not be sufficient uh, to fund uh, both uh, current expenditures and future capital needs uh, to address the, the necessary uh, investments to really mitigate uh, the climate challenge. Um, as a consequence, I do uh, support uh, Councillor Menard's motion uh, to have uh, city staff explore climate financing opportunities that include uh, debt limit adjustments, uh, bonds and, and loans, uh, such as green bonds, and uh, the limited use of reserve funds. Uh, I did note um, uh, during um, uh, the uh, discussion with it with our deputant, uh, Ms. Keller Herzog, that uh, there were a uh, different type of model um, that, that was suggested in terms of a corporation that could deal with uh, investments. So I just wanted to ask the treasurer, uh, um, could uh, that exploration be extended uh, through this motion to really examine um, that type of model? Thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, I think that's something we'd really need to understand uh, in terms of uh, what's being asked and what kind of kind of setup that would be um, and how arm's length it would be. From there, we'd have to um, take a look at the appropriate legislation in the Municipal Act in terms of what we can and can't do around investments um, to determine if that's truly feasible or not. 
Okay. I, I would uh, just love to see that uh, exploration, if possible, in this exercise. Um, as we know, uh, the, the federal government is, uh, has established an infrastructure bank. I just want to know whether this would be the most efficient model to uh, potentially apply for uh, the, the, the large uh, range of, of um, initiatives that uh, they uh, will support, uh, whether it's around clean power or whether it's around large scale uh, building retrofits. Um, so that's something ideally I'd like uh, some consideration at too. And hopefully uh, this motion can speak to that uh, because I do believe that the use of uh, debt financing is a, is a logical choice uh, for capital projects requiring uh, sufficient um, upfront investments um, as uh, market liquidity right now is, is definitely plentiful. Uh, current uh, interest rates are extremely low. And, and obviously borrowing is a, is a logical choice for uh, capital projects as we've seen with uh, the LRT uh, that requires significant upfront uh, investment as a city. So um, if we could uh, get a little bit more detail in, in the report, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, just wanted to so ask you directly, is that a, are you looking to amend what's in front of us? I was just uh, trying to determine uh, whether um, the, the motion as, as written would encapsulate uh, that, that type of exploration uh, around, um, uh, I guess, different um, structures that, that might be a more amenable to, to uh, um, those types of um, uh, submissions uh, for, for uh, grants or loans. Yeah, I'm not certain the way it's worded it would do that per se. Uh, Councilor Bernard, I don't know if you wanted to look yep. to... I can comment. Um, thank you, Chair. And, and thanks for raising this, Councillor King. It, it's an important one. It, within the energy evolution um, uh, document, there are there is a section around the municipal uh, budget implications. And it goes through um, various municipal sources of funding that could be explored. It's in section 4.6. And uh, the motion does speak to it in, in one of the whereas clauses, not in a be it resolved clause, but it speaks to uh, financing opportunities, either, you know, um, in terms of debt limit adjustments, bonds, loans, as you mentioned, uh, green bonds, um, reserve funds. But within that um, document, and, and indeed with the, the climate change team, there's certain, from what my conversation, they're very open to different models that could achieve this and uh, to the delegation's comments, uh, certainly open to it. So I think within the whereas clause, we're, we're covered within that clause. Uh, if, if staff are saying we need something additional to say, look at other mechanisms, um, I would put it in the motion and be completely friendly about that. But I don't think I'm not, I'm not hearing that from staff, and, but they should clarify if they need to see that from us. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. And obviously uh, I want to see uh, maximal innovation around uh, climate financing tools and, and the way that we explore uh, their, their utilization um, at the city of Ottawa. So I do appreciate that. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor King. Thank you, Councilor Bernard. I think if there's any if there's any need for any clarification, we can always toss in a, a quick uh, amendment at, uh, at Council yep. when this comes there. Yep. All right. Thank you, uh, Councilor Brockington, and then Councilor Hebley. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a few questions. First of all, to Councilor's, Councilor Cloutier's question, where when you intervened and said this is basically about giving a mandate to study further, this is what that is, right, Councilor? Menard is asking staff to do the work, come back to Fedco, and we'll decide what to do at that point. But my, I want to focus on clause one first, because I have a question to staff, and that is, um, once council endorsed the, uh, the master plan, the climate change master plan, was it not already part of their plan to do what is outlined in item one, and that is look at projects that they can put resources towards that generate income or savings to the city. I'm just trying to understand whether Councillor Menard's motion, you know, there's greater nuance. He's specifically looking at projects that will generate income or save us money. Is this new or were staff already planning to do this? Chair, I don't know if, if I should answer this or Councillor Menard should answer this, but I, I think the difference between what Councillor Menard's 
put forward in this report versus the original energy evolution report is council does have a business case process that we can bring forward at any time a proposal for investment that would save us money. Uh, I think what the difference between that, which the energy evolution report does refer to, and Councilor Menard's report, and Councilor, please, Councilor Menard, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it does look at uh, debt financing as a way of, ex as an option to accelerate some of those things where the business case isn't necessarily there today on a pure cash flow basis. If I'm incorrect about that, I, I welcome to be corrected. No, so you're correct. That That is the intent. Um, and uh, we've also been talking for some time now with you know Hydro Ottawa and Bari and, and talking about that type of borrowing to get those other projects done. This furthers council's direction to look at that type of a, a situation. So um, that's the hope with this. It is, it is narrowing in. Um, and I, the, Mr. Willis is correct in, in the interpretation. So do I understand correctly, uh, Chair, through you that the staff report may, may list, this is hypothetical, 10 projects that would be debt financed that would generate income, what it would cost, and then what the return on that investment would be. And then you would enumerate a number, another set of projects that we would debt finance that they would then provide savings to the city and you would estimate those savings over time. Is that basically what your report might include? That's my intent. I'd like to see that uh, information come forward. Uh, staff may interpret it similarly, uh, but I'll leave it to that. Chair, if I could be helpful to to respond, and again, not to contradict this Council Menard, because this is his report. I think as energy evolution rolls out and staff in various departments bring forward initiatives, they will always bring the business case forward uh, that addresses the points that you refer to. You know, what is the cost? What is the payback? Does this, is this a self-financing project or is additional uh, support required? Required. That would be our intent in any project. I think if I'm correct, again, in interpreting the, the Council Menards report, it would give us the, the option of then exploring debt to, uh, to kind of close the gap uh, or extend the, what would Council normally extend the business planning time frame or shorten, really shorten it. And the, the payback period would be uh, closed by a debt uh, solution and that would be available should, this, uh, should the treasurer's work prove that this is viable within the debt cap. And so the main difference between clause or section one and two is section one talks about debt financing. Section two talks about uh, new funding mechanisms. So I would assume that would be anything other than debt, the issuance of debt. Is that correct? Yes, there's a number of other financing mechanisms other municipalities have used and that's that's what that's referring to. Okay, so and then staff are asked to bring this back. Is it Q2? I, I just don't see when this is coming back. Yes, the intent was to align with the uh, long range financial plan uh, uh, discussion. I believe we had initially put in Q1, but I believe we took that out. And so uh, there may be some more time required to, to do this work. Um, so I'm not sure when staff are anticipating the bringing it back, but um, 2021 was the, the goal. Okay. All right, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hubley. Thank you, Chair. I, I have similar concerns to uh, Councillor Brockington uh, with the way I'm reading this. And I'm wondering if we can uh, perhaps as a friendly amendment, uh, put some of what uh, Councillor Menard has said into this motion so that we know, for example, that it's not a blanket request to raise debt levels to fund all the projects in energy evolution. That as Councillor Brockington said, that there will be a individual listing of the project come forward and that we will be funding things such as uh, your example chair about LED lightings that you know, pay, pay themselves off within five to eight years. Those kinds of projects, I think everybody can get behind. What I'm concerned with here is uh, using debt to uh, convert all the police cars to electric cars in the next five years. Uh, I think we have to put some kind of uh, parameters around this to say that that's what we're looking at and, and not just a blank check. 
if that can be done, then I can support the motion. Otherwise, I think I'd like to split at least split it, or I'll just vote against one or the other. I can respond if you'd like, Chair. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, ultimately, I think that the I think the concerns um, are addressed through what comes out of this. Like, I don't, you know, this this isn't something. But I, I mean, I already said that. But go ahead, go ahead, Councilor Bernard. Sure. I mean, absolutely. Yes, that that is um, certainly the intent. And so, in, in the motion, in that first clause, the beat resolve clause, it goes through projects and energy evolution that either generate income or savings for the city. That will have to come back and be approved. Uh, we won't just be saying it's all in uh, that 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 comes back to us. And that's the intent of the motion. And it is specific around projects that will generate uh, savings for the city. So we'll have that decision to make later. Fedco will also have that decision to make later. Um, and uh, it just it, this gets the ball rolling uh, for that work to be done. And in some areas where we've been kind of talking about it, doing it, um, it brings those to the forefront, such as our building retrofits. So. Um, I think it, in the motion, it's, it's addressing what your concern is and the intent is, uh, is outlined there in terms of coming back to us for approval of uh, lists of projects that would come. So I think, I think points well taken. And, and to that, you know, if there's, if there's some need to clarify intent, because obviously we, we govern by motion and not by intent. If there's some feeling in this that the intent is not being recognized properly, you know, I can work with Councilor Menard and we can add on just a clarification aspect to make sure it's, it's still the same motion, but that the concerns about intent are all are fully covered. And I, I know Councilor Menard would be amenable to that because it doesn't uh, change anything, but it would, it would uh, provide that clarity that is being sought by members of committee. So are you willing to do that now so that uh, the motion by the time it rises to council and gets reported out to the public after this meeting, it's clear that we're not looking at increasing uh, the debt load. And, and I want to give you a, a perspective of where I'm coming from. I supported your roadmap on uh, the climate change initiatives because that's what you explained it as. It was a roadmap on how we could get to uh, that point if we choose to go down each of those uh, pathways listed in the report. That was a very good report because it told us how to do that. And it didn't have, it was reported that it had the $87 billion ask, but there was no motion there or 57, sorry. There was no motion there to approve 57 billion in spending. So I just want to try to avoid falling in that same trap because I think it's a good effort here. I, I like what you're trying to do if it's done the way you're explaining it. So if you could just add a sentence uh, at the end of that, um, clarifying that what we're looking at is uh, uh, coming back with projects that uh, will have a good return on them so that we can fund those quicker. There's other things that won't have a good return that we may want to fund, but if we're voting on them individually, I have no problem with that. I just don't want a blank check uh, written on our debt load here. If there's a, I don't care if all you add to the, at the end of this is this is not a blank check. You'll get my message across, okay? So uh, I leave it with you. Can you do something, the two of you come up with a, a line to add in there that would make that more palatable or yeah. more clear? Yeah, the point's well taken. I, I think this goes to Fedco. So this will be on the next agenda of Fedco. And what we'll do is we'll add something there. I, I think I don't, I think I'd like to talk to Councilor Bernard and, and, and staff and make sure that we're putting the right stuff in place. The fact that this does go to another committee before it goes to council gives us that opportunity. And you're on FedCo with me, so we'll be able to take care of that. Okay, then uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna dissent on the motion then if you, we can't clarify it now, but uh, I will likely support it if, when and if we can make those kinds of changes to it. And I congratulate you both on good work for this. You almost made it. Thank you. We'll get there. All right. Thank you. That's, then that's fine. And that's, I mean, I know that's, uh, you know, Councillor Lieber often takes the same approach. He'll vote against certain things at, at planning committee and then look into it a bit further and, and get, uh, get clarification and then vote in favor at, uh, at, uh, at council. So it's um, perfectly within reason to, to take that approach. So um, thank you uh, to everyone. Thank you to the delegates and, and Councillor Bernard. Um, so on item three, obviously there's one and two. So, on on the item, dissent, 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 <coughs> Councillor Hubley and dissent from Councillor Derus. Thank you.
Uh, item four, divestment from fossil fuels and increase in sustainable assets. This is another item that I know Council Mars worked on actually for over over a year. We're just started working on this with uh, with Marion Similik. Um, so to this, I'll do it properly. Uh, Council Mar, do you want to just um, you know high level? Obviously, we have the 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 comments here that the the words of the motion and the report uh, in front of us. But if you just want to give it a high level sort of approach as to as to what this is. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the the city um, uh, currently has its strategic climate um, uh, lens that we're going to be considering at our at our um, midterm governance review. And in, in the meantime, we've been seeing environmental implications come forward. What we're trying to do here is align our investments with those energy evolution goals and our climate change master plan. Um, we have uh, an endowment that the city has um, that is invested now. And there's been community discussion for many years um, in terms of looking at um, ways to have this conversation uh, while the city is working on getting prudent investor status to have less restrictive rules around investment. Um, this is something that uh, would come forward and look at our investments in the fossil fuel industry. We are talking about a relatively small portion of the endowment um, uh, that we've got invested. It's a, it's a, it's around uh, seven and eight million. It, it presents um, an ideal low risk opportunity to, to look at this. Um, and that's what this is doing is staff would come back to us, uh, report on um, uh, the feasibility of it and, uh, and work over a number of years to, uh, uh, to look at our investments. The bottom line too is, I mean, these investments haven't done well for us um, at all lately, and and there is a there is a need to to start to shift. Um, it make seems to make financial sense as well as um, environmental sense, given the goals that we've just set out. Um, and so, uh, I think that sets it up well for the conversation, uh, Chair. Um, and I can hand it back back to you. All right, thank you. And I mean, this wouldn't be we wouldn't be the only ones doing this. I think if you pay any attention to the the stock market get in the trading and and buying Warren Buffett is currently selling off shares of many of these same things uh, quite rapidly. Um, all right. So we'll go to our delegation, uh, Angela Kellerhertzog. Thank you very much, chair. Um, I would like to, on behalf of cafes, um, speak in opposition to this motion. Um, this motion is well-intentioned but we feel it's been beaten back into a feeble proposition that makes very little sense. And I will, of course, explain to you why we think that. Firstly, the city of Ottawa, if the city of Ottawa wants to divest the endowment fund from fossil fuel investment, all that needs to be done is an amendment to the investment policy of the city to this effect, bingo. There is no provincial or other regulation that prevents us from saying that we will not invest in something. The prudent investor status is not required for this. That relates to us investing in additional market vehicles and having more freedoms. So it has nothing to do with divestment, really. Secondly, the motion proposes to sell off fossil fuel holdings over the next five years. This is not timely. The Canadian energy sector, particularly the oil sands based industries are in crisis. Capital is fleeing the sector. And do we really want our money to stay till the bitter end? This is the economic and financial argument. Um, but having declared a climate emergency, a directive to divest should be issued immediately. And again, could be done very quickly, not in five years. Second, uh, third point. In view of the need to capitalize the energy evolution strategy to invest in positive return projects, as Mr. Hubley also agrees we should do, um, it's our recommendation that the remaining 190 million of the endowment fund be entirely divested from highly volatile markets, stocks and bonds, and brought home. This money should be used to capitalize a climate capital corporation in a revolving fund that can invest in local energy projects, include renewable energy investments, stimulate our local economy and create local jobs. 
the economic development strategy of the city of Ottawa, which currently does not mention the word climate or energy even once, should be brought to align with the benefits from steering towards a low carbon economy. Thank you very much, committee. And that is the end of my interventions for today. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions for, yes, Councillor Menard. I'll just uh, just briefly um, I understand uh, your point and you want this to, to go further uh, than it does. I, I get that um, as well. Um, this is one where we had to work with uh, staff on and for, for some time now to get the ball rolling, to have the discussion, to start the process. And um, I understand uh, it may not be uh, perfect um, and appreciate your, your view on that. Um, but it does start the start the discussion and, and get it get us moving in, in, in a direction where we get some study back from staff, uh, an analysis by FEDCO and then uh, and then council as a whole. So uh, that five year piece, uh, if it is approved, it could come back or, or not. Um, sorry if I'm sorry about that. Um, OK, we're going to stop. Um, well, the, the point getting is getting muted that, and unmuted by accident. I don't know if <laughs> it's me or so. I, I think that if the point is that we want to divest the endowment fund from fossil fuels, that question can be put very directly. And if there is a vote on it, then at least citizens can see which councillors are in support and which ones are against. And, and that kind of clarity can also be useful. But to be proposing something that makes reference to another regulatory instrument, which is this prudential um, thing, is 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 misleading. It's unnecessary, and to propose to do something in a five-year time plan is is I think not timely, which is like a polite wording for irresponsible. So I'm I'm sorry, Councillor Menard, that we're not able to support you on this. We we really think that it misses the mark. Although it's well-intentioned, we understand that. All right, uh, thank you, Angela. Appreciate um, you coming here. I think, you know, personally, I think I understand what Councilor Menard is, is striving for. And I think I go back to uh, a month ago and Rob Barnes had said, let's not, perfect be, let's not let perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to um, the energy evolution uh, project. And I think, you know, there's no question that a certain motion could come forward and you could find out which councillor supports and which councillor doesn't. I don't think Councillor Menard actually wants to know that. I think he wants results. And I think he's brought forward a, a process that most likely gets him toward the results he's looking for. Um, the end result has to be the, the ultimate goal, uh, not just the optics of the end result. So I, you know, to that end, I think he's brought forward something that is uh, achievable. And I think that's, the important thing here, the most important thing, uh, not not just getting it done instantly, which might not be feasible uh, from a support perspective, but actually just getting it done. Uh, and to that end, I think he's actually produced something that um, will get there. Uh, Councillor Brockington, uh, thank you, Angela. Appreciate that. Uh, Councillor, is it for the delegation or is it for just on the item? Uh, no, for staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Go ahead, Councillor. Thanks, Chair. Um, can staff in layman's language explain to the committee what prudent investor status means? So currently we're limited in terms of the types of investments we can make uh, and prudent investor gives us the, um, the regulations give us the uh, authority to expand that to a broader portfolio, but based on prudent. And so uh, you need flexibility uh, to manage prudently. It has to be a balanced portfolio. And if you, when you have very limited options, pulling one piece out uh, impacts the entire portfolio. And it has to be a balanced approach. And that's why Prudent gives us significantly more flexibility to review this as part of our strategy. Sure, you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket, but how does the corporation get status? So we have to uh, put in the um, governance structures required to do that. It requires a committee of external advisors, and it also requires uh, an investment strategy to be developed. Up to now, we've been uh, um, 
seeking from the province changes to the regulation because currently the regulations are very onerous. Uh, Toronto is the only one who's implemented. I think there's one other municipality looking at doing it. Um, and uh, it, it, it costs them a lot of time and money to implement the infrastructure. And we were asking for an opportunity to be able to outsource some of it and seek out external uh, experts to help to manage this process. And uh, with COVID and delays, uh, we have not received a response from the province. So we are continuing to explore putting in prudent with the current regulations and understanding what the impacts are. And that's the, what speaks to the first piece coming back in Q2 to understand those uh, costs and restrictions. So clause one is basically, you're gonna report back to Fedco on your progress to um, elevate the city of Ottawa's investment abilities to prudent and venture status. The report just basically says, here are some of the barriers we are in uh, coming across to go down this route and what we're doing as the motion says, actions taken to date to address those. It's basically a status update, is that correct? It, it's an analysis of uh, the pros and cons of moving to prudent or staying status quo, because we could stay status quo. Those are the two options. And so it's looking at the costs of implementing prudent and the benefits to see if there's a cost benefit associated with it. Do we need to do this to achieve what the delegate just said? She said, look, you, can, you have got the power just to divest from fossil fuel corporations to begin with. Can we just do it that simply? That was my, my earlier point, Mr. Chair, is that we can't just pull an entire sector out of our portfolio when we're so limited in our ability to rebalance it. And we look okay. at it from an overall portfolio perspective. And because we're so restricted right now, it's very difficult to do. So if we want to divest from corporations that are geared towards fossil fuel industry, we must do this first step. Correct. Okay. Do you support that? I do. Okay. So you'll report back to, to Fedco. Now, Mr. Chair, my, my question now is, and I will support clause one of uh, Councillor Menard's motion. My question about clause two says, should council approve a direction to implement prudent investor standards for the city of Ottawa, blah, blah, blah. Are we not getting ahead of ourselves? Should we not reflect on part two of the motion until we've heard back from staff at Fedco in Q2? Should we not first hear the analysis? And if it's decided that we can do this, then we entertain part two. I look to you or, or Councillor Menard. I'm just not understanding why we deal with part two today. We should find out whether we can change our status on how we invest. And then if we have the green light, then we'll deal with part two. Well, I no, think part, no, I can respond. Chair, would you like me to respond or did you want to go to? Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, can, I can refer to that. It, 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 um, Councillor Brockington, part part two is the is the intent. The barrier to that intent as it's been described to me from staff, is that prudent invest investor status. Yeah. Uh, and so the intent of the motion was always part two, to have that come back, give us the analysis on what this would mean for us, what other investments are out there, et cetera. Um, so part one is really only uh, to enact part two. The, the, the piece that's important uh, in terms of our, our actual actions here around, around uh, divestment in this case is part two. And, that, and that's why uh, it's, it's phrased this way. Staff have pointed out they want prudent investor status before we move there. Uh, that's why that's in there. So it is important that, that, that um, you know, part two uh, move forward, uh, which was the original intent of the discussion. But we're not going to do anything until the Fedco report comes out at Q2, right? We're going to receive that and debate it. And that report might have recommendations that could change what you have in part two of the motion today. We might not want to divest fossil fuels over the next five years, for example. We it may have recommendations that do differentiate from what is in the report, but we're making it clear, we wanna see that research done. And that's okay if it has uh, divergent recommendations. Uh, but the, the point of this, to just say that the environment committee is gonna pass this piece around prudent investor status and not have the intent uh, go along with it wouldn't make much sense to me. Uh, the intent is what's important. And so even if it, they come up with a different analysis at Fedco, so be it at that time. 
but at least do the work to, to get there uh, with that intent in number two. I appreciate the question and, and why you're raising it though. I mean, you can almost, you can almost equate it to, uh, uh, to a holding provision in planning, you know, we'll approve uh, a planning file with a holding provision. It's, it's a condition essentially on it to say that, you know, this doesn't happen until that it's approved by council. Um, but this doesn't happen until this happens. And uh, ultimately too, if it was just item one, it's completely out of our terms of reference for this committee. Yeah, I, item two is again, staff's evaluating, they come back with a report. We're not giving the marching orders to do anything. I, I just think that whatever comes back to us in Q2, we are probably going to change the action item from what's before us in item two. I, I think we're gonna say, we're gonna reflect on whatever staff report and we're gonna say, all right, now with that information on hand, we're gonna create a strategy going forward. So- But it, does, it doesn't make item two out of order. I mean, item two is still, I agree. I agree. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So I see no more questions from members of the committee. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, so that the standing committee on environment protection, water and waste management recommend council approve one that the chief financial officer and or manager uh, treasury be directed to report back to fed co at the end of Q2 in 2021 with a summary of barriers to achieving prudent investor status how they are addressing those barriers and a summary of those action of actions taken to date. And two, that should council approve a direction to implement prudent investor standards for the city of Ottawa staff evaluate the prudence of divesting of fossil fuels as input uh, to the development of the investment strategy that will need to be approved by council. Uh, the scope of this review will include an assessment of the following a no new purchase of stocks or mutual funds with coal, oil, and gas companies specifically excluding any new investments in the 200 largest publicly traded uh, fossil fuel corporations and B sell off all fossil fuel holdings from these same companies over the next five years. Chair. Yep. I'm sorry to intervene again. Um, just reading my notes. I hope this is perceived as a friendly direction to staff, but in the report back to us at the end of Q2, could they also have some information in the report that generally talks about our overall investment strategy to give us a greater context of what our object objectives are? Obviously, it's to have a return on investment, but could that be included in the report? Sorry, you're phrasing that as a, as a friendly amendment? Well, staff might already plan to do that, but I'm, I'm looking for a, a global context, which will help me absorb our plan. Okay, Isabel, it looks like you want to respond. Yeah, so uh, part of uh, ex a, a agreeing to move to Prudent, uh, the first thing that we have to do is develop an investment strategy, but the report can speak to a broader, higher level strategy that we would incorporate into that strategy. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so on the item, is that item? No, I'll just say there. Okay. This sounds. Okay, so dissent from Councillor Hubley and Councillor Drews. Uh, otherwise, the item is carried. Um, so we move to item five, which is new protect new tree protection bylaw uh, administrative updates. Um, so just some brief history. I know Martha Copestake is here with us. Is going to uh, queue this up as well. But um, as members of the committee know, we approved. Uh, the new tree protection bylaw um, about a year ago, uh, the, in, the intention was a, a dual implementation date. There would be a, a staged implementation date. Um, that didn't occur. COVID threw in a wrench a bit of, to that. Uh, Councilor McKenney uh, worked with, with staff to get us back on track uh, for that January 1st, 2021 implementation date. But there was to be kind of a, a step in between the two imp implementation dates where some of the stuff would have been addressed. Um, so we didn't have that. Uh, that's why staff are back here right now uh, for some of those uh, housekeeping uh, amendments in order to get this uh, up and running and in place for January 1st, uh, 2021. It uh, is completely in line with the previous approved tree protection bylaw uh, from last year. Uh, Martha, did you wanna just queue up that, uh, that report? The, what, what you're asking committee to approve today? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone. It's nice to see everyone today. Thanks for having me. Um, 
So as Councillor Moffat said, in preparation for the implementation of the new tree bylaw, there are just a few sort of like housekeeping administrative type items that we need to be that need to be addressed before the bylaw gets enacted and comes into effect on January 1st. So I'm basically here to just explain those changes. But because we haven't talked about the tree bylaw together in a while, I thought that I would take a little bit of a step back and sort of go over the timeline to where we like how we got where we are now, which um, Chair Moffat did, did just go over a little bit. And then also just go over some of the great improvements that are being made to the bylaw. So everybody remembers all the great stuff we planned to do a year ago and now we're finally doing. Um, and then I'll just get into the small housekeeping changes and, and be done. So I don't wanna to take too much time, but I am gonna take maybe a little bit more time than would normally be uh, required for these small housekeeping changes. And also just because there was over the last sort of 24 hours or so, there has been some sort of confusion around what's happening with this report and, um, and sort of how the bylaw applies across the urban area. So I did, I sort of added some notes and I hope you'll, um, you know, you guys are okay with me Taking, taking a chance to sort of uh, explain in a little bit more detail how the, the bylaw applies and what we're here to do today. So just wanna note that we're not recommending to today, we're not recommending to remove anything that was approved as a part of the tree protection bylaw a, a year ago um, in January at council. What we're doing today is staff is proposing additions to accommodate the distinctive tree size change in the inner urban area. So that's sort of what we're focused on today. Like I said, I'll go into more detail in a second. And then just to go over exactly how the bylaws structured so that we're all on the same page and, and we it, it, it can be kind of confusing because there's different um, stipulations for different parts of the city. So I'm just gonna take a, a, a couple minutes or a minute or so to go over how, it's, how it works. So basically the new tree bylaw functions fundamentally in the same way as our old tree bylaw functions. Sorry, Chris, I'm gonna be talking on this for a little bit of time, so we can stay on this slide for a while. <laughs> um, uh, so it functions fundamentally in the same way as our old tree bylaw function, our old two tree bylaws function. And that means that it has sections for city trees, for municipal natural areas, citywide, and for the urban area, um, there are regulations that, the regulations that apply to urban trees on private land are based on property size. So for properties greater than a hectare in size, and for all properties that are going through site plan or plan of subdivision applications, regardless of property size, a tree, a tree permit's required to remove trees that are 10 centimeters in diameter or greater. Um, and in development scenarios, this is, which is mostly how this is implemented. It's implemented through the review and approval of tree conservation reports for tree retention and tree removal and landscape plans for tree planting on the site in compensation for what we're losing. So this is all done by our city foresters here. And um, this applies urban wide in the inner urban area and in the suburbs. Um, the new bylaw essentially makes no changes to that part. We're keeping that intact as it is because we believe that it's working uh, very well. So for properties one hectare or less in size, so those sort of smaller residential properties in the urban area, a permit is required to remove distinctive trees. So as a result of the motion on the bylaw in June, this, the distinctive trees will now be 30 centimeters in diameter or greater in the inner urban area that used to be 50 centimeters. And that was in place for about 11 years. So this is a big and good move for Ottawa's urban tree canopy. In the outer urban area or the suburbs, the distinctive tree diameter will remain at 50 centimeters um, or greater in diameter. And this part of the bylaw is implemented through the issuance of distinctive tree permits. Um, for residents who may want to remove a tree in their backyard for some reason, and also through the infill development processes that we're putting in place, have in place and are improving um, for Jan as of January 1st um, by reviewing committee of adjustment applications and building permit applications um, and looking at the tree impacts of those. And we issue tree permits where necessary, requiring tree, and we require tree protection where necessary and tree compensation. So the major tree issue, as most of you know, the major tree issue we've seen in Ottawa over the last many years is a loss of trees to infill development in the urban area. And I mean, of course, this is in addition to emerald ash borer, but the, something we have a bit more control over is the loss of trees due to infill development. And our tree bylaw review that we've been working on for the past few years was really focused on solving this main issue. So decreasing the distinctive tree diameter within the inner urban area staff saw as a key component of addressing that major tree loss that we've been seeing. And we believe that this overall change 
will result in uh, the protection of more trees and infill development scenarios. So there's just my bringing us all back up to speed. So of course, as Councillor Moffat said, um, it was approved. The new tree protection bylaw was approved at Council uh, last January. We were in, it was intended to be implemented on May 1st, but that became um, impossible to do because of the pandemic. Um, so uh, in June, Councillor McKenney brought forward a motion to uh, direct staff to implement the new bylaw as of January 1st and to reduce that distinctive tree diameter to 30 centimeters. And of course, now we're here to just do these administrative updates. And on January 1st, we will bring the new tree protection bylaw into effect, which we are all very excited about. So I'm gonna take, uh, we can go to the next slide, Chris. So just a quick rapid fire round of some of the big, huge improvements that we are making with the new tree protection bylaw, just to bring everybody back into uh, loop, I guess on this after the last couple of months, all these months. So again, reducing the distinctive tree diameter, of course. Um, tree information will now be submitted and considered through the committee of adjustment um, application process. And as Steve Willis uh, said before, we have a new infill forester in place who's been hired. Uh, it's Nancy Young, who uh, has been a forester in the forestry department for many years, and now she will be our new infill forester in planning. And she'll focus on trees at that earliest phase of development, which is great and a will be a huge improvement. Um, there will be better integration of tree information through the building permit process, um, more oversight, better tree information provided, closer integration with building code services staff, all good things. The new bylaw also includes clearer tree protection requirements, so this will give staff more ability to have oversight over tree protection and the ability to fine based on inadequate tree protection. We've got clear linkages between the tree bylaw implementation, implementation and the new zoning requirements the infill zoning requirements for soft landscaping. So that will help to both get new trees planted, but also to protect, ex like retain existing trees on site, um, depending on the site. We've got new formalized tree compensation requirements for when trees are permitted to be removed. Um, and we've got higher application fees, which we talked about before for cost recovery. Um, we've also have put new urban forest policies into the draft OP, which is being released later this week. And these will be fundamental to securing, um, like sort of further securing all the principles of the urban forest management plan and the tree bylaw into planning policy. And of course, what I think is the most important aspect, we've been seeing, we've talked about this over sort of change of attitude around trees, and we've really been seeing that. Um, there's been a big change on that front. We've had lots of wins over the last year that we wouldn't have had before we started these conversations, and it's very positive to see. Okay, so now what we're here actually here for today. Uh, Chris, you can change to the next slide, thanks. Um, so we have four changes we need to make. Um, the first is pretty simple. We just need to basically um, change the definition of distinctive tree to decrease the size within the inner urban area from a minimum of 50 centimeters to 30 centimeters dBH or greater as per the council motion. Um, and again, this is specific, well, oh, sorry, that's it. That's it for the first one. That's the easy one. The second one is, um, so following the, um, the change in size for distinctive trees, um, staff are recommending that we amend the tree compensation requirements um, to reflect that smaller distinctive tree size. So this is specifically for trees in infill development, privately owned trees in infill development scenarios. So staff recommend keeping, as I said, keeping the approved compensation ratio for 50 centimeters or greater. Um, but and which is three to one. So that's three trees are planted for every single tree removed. And we're saying that we should add a second replacement ratio. So taking sort of a stepped approach for trees 30 to 49 centimeters in diameter. So that would be, that new ratio would be two to one. So we'd have, um, so two trees would be planted for every single tree permitted to be removed. So this scaled approach is, um, is a tick tree compensation is something that is broadly used. Um, by looking at tree size, and it's used in other, other municipalities on Ontario as well, and this is what staff recommend that we, we do here as well. Um, we can go to the next slide, Chris. So the third thing is, um, this is a real simple one. We'd like to, um, it's basically something that we overlooked when we first created the tree information report guidelines that are housed within the tree bylaw. And what we'd like to do is add the requirement in those guidelines to submit a photograph of the tree that's being um, requested to be removed. We often get 
photographs like this now, and they're very helpful for our forestry inspectors um, as they're uh, navigating through their initial review of files and such. And so we just like to add that, that simple requirement to get a photograph. And so that's in Schedule C of the existing bylaw. Um, and the fourth, the fourth thing is, is um, not entirely related to the tree bylaw, but it is, in, it is related to our, how we're implementing the tree bylaw and all the tree elements that, that uh, we've been working on related to infill development. So this last change is to repeal the $700 refundable tree planting deposit that's in the planning fees bylaw. So this, um, this tree planting fee, the $700 tree planting fee was a recommendation of the infill one report um, way back in 2012, and it was added to the planning fee bylaw in 2016, and it's implemented entirely by forestry. Um, basically, what happens is that for an infill development, the fee is paid, and when some they plant a tree on site, the fee is refunded to them. So given that we have the new sort of uh, integrated tree compensation requirements in the tree um, protection bylaw for infill developments, we feel that the fee, the $700 fee, is now redundant. Um, the new tree compensation requirements in, conduct, in conjunction with the new infill for zoning, uh, infill zoning for soft landscaping requirements are gonna help to ensure appropriate um, planting in a way that we never had before. We think it's gonna work a lot better. And so we're recommending that effective January 1st, when the new bylaw comes into effect, the planning fee bylaw be amended to remove that refundable tree planting deposit. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Chris, thanks. So that's about it. Thank you so much for having me to fill you in on the administrative changes and just remind everybody what this bylaw is all about. And we're really looking forward to finally putting all this hard work into play on January 1st. It's been quite a long road and uh, I think everyone, everyone's ready to go on this one. <laughs> thanks. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martha. Appreciates uh, your work obviously on this as I've noted multiple times in the past. Um, uh, it's an important file and something that we've all uh, been pushing for and, and supporting. Uh, so the fact that we're right here on the cusp of implementation is incredibly important. Um, and just to that end, so what we're dealing with today is not a rehashing of the tree protection bylaw, but dealing with the administrative updates that we have here today. Um, which are really all positive. So we do have a delegation on this. It's the chair of the Canada Green Space Protection Coalition, Barbara Ramsey. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Moffat. Um, and thank you, Ms. Kopstick, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, oh, thank you, Christopher, for my one slide. I wanted to make things very brief and short today. I wasn't going to call for the slide quite yet, but uh, it probably looks better than I do. So uh, I'm happy to have it up there. And if I could just find now uh, my comments, we're good to go. So thanks for the introduction. I am the chair of the Canada Green Space Protection Coalition, and I live in Ward 4. Uh, Part of Canada. Our not-for-profit organization is now approaching 2,000 residents in Canada North who favor the protection and development of urban open green space and by default trees. Our association is a member of CAFES, an organization I know you know well, and the FCA and I also serve on the board of the FCA. CAFES developed their working document Tree Action Now and have shared it freely as part of the ongoing relationship with staff and the committee, as well as, as, well as other members and commu community organizations. Unfortunately, there is content in the staff report today that is not mirrored in this report, and that's what brings me here today. The more familiar faces to you were unavailable. First and foremost, DBH decrease specific to the inner urban areas only. Hindsight is 2020. The November 2019 staff report approved by council in January apparently differentiated the DBH metric between inner and outer urban wards. Our volunteers did not contemplate it. It was not flagged in the Tree Action Now priority documents as a result, and it wasn't raised broadly in the community. And so we are here today to speak to the error of what we see as a two-pronged standard. The best example I have for you. 
I hope you are all aware of the singular Beaverbrook project called Neighbor Woods, which uses a model developed by Dr. Andy Kenny at the University of Toronto to create neighborhood tree inventory using trained volunteers, the precursor to an urban forest management plan. Rob McCauley, its chief volunteer, uh, has looked at the data collected in Beaverbrook to assess the impact of this specific policy on its inventory of 2,000 trees. Instead of protecting only 18% of our trees, 360, with a DBH greater than 50, we would actually protect 1,040 trees, or 52%, with a DBH of 30 centimeters. Let me say that again, 360 trees or, or 1,040 trees. That is essentially a three-fold increment in Canada North alone, probably representative in Canada South, possibly River Ward. We're afforded the same protections as City View, the Glebe, Centertown, or Alta Vista. Neighborwood shows us what we all know. The value of decisions based on facts and specifics are better than those on generalization. Tr neighborhood tree canopy inventories matter. Now we understand that a request for neighborhood tree canopy data and targets remains outstanding at this committee and is being contemplated through the work on the official plan and we hope at the urban forest working group table. The communities of Beaverbrook and Canada Lakes are master planned around trees and green space. The longer it takes to develop a meaningful neighborhood-based inventory will surely result in greater compromise to our urban forest and the urban forest across the city. Number two, the tree compensation ratio. The changes recommended here are a surprise for our community. A change from three to one to two to one in the outer urban areas was not signaled to our CAFE's team. And so it was not raised in our Tree Action Now document. Most important takeaway here, two to one, three to one, or even five to one, compensation levels are not a panacea. My graphic uh, is borrowed from Dr. Andy Kenny at the University of Toronto. And I think, Show, shows the exponential nature of benefits that result directly from increasing tree size. Failing to protect 30 to 49 centimeter trees in an outer urban area is to fail to maintain a healthy tree population and the conditions needed for the development of the future canopy. The loss is a canopy lost, a minimal period of 15 to 20 years. You've heard today that there is a desire to see the lens as a polity decision applied equally. Given that the majority of subdivision and greenfield development is outside the green belt, will it will abandon large opportunities for tree preservation in parts of Ottawa. Quite simply, as an oversight or decision taking body, do you choose to make 1000 individual efforts to protect 1000 trees? Or do you want to protect those 1,000 trees with a single policy and a lot less activity and management? And of course, let's be honest, woodland stands are not comprised of only 50 centimeter trees. They are in perpetual renewal. And many woodland stands are on small hectares of property. In many neighborhoods outside of Ottawa, outside the Greenbelt, like Beaverbrook and others, tomorrow is also here today. The renovations and infills are moving to update and upgrade these developments as well. And as you know, the trees are often the first to go. The KGPC as well as cafes would propose that great work on the tree by protection bylaw continue. That's why I'm here. But I'm here to request that the distinctive tree status be amended in all urban areas from 50 to 50 centimeters to 30 centimeters. The tree compensation requirements be maintained at three to one in all urban areas. Next step, staff are rolling forward the integration of urban forest management principles and policies in the official plan and to prepare the imminent rollout of the new bylaw and that is well and good. We are pleased with the ongoing development of the urban, urban forest working group. This is a good thing and I would like to applaud the staff 
for their efforts. Before I sign off, I want to salute the work of key volunteers, Daniel Buckles and Jennifer Humphreys on this file, as well as a person you know well, CAFE's co-chair, Angela Keller Herzog and Liz Bernstein. And if in my advocacy today to remail the approach to DBH and compensation into an all Ottawa approach, I fail. I offer to throw our organization into the ring with the Urban Forest Working Group to ensure the voice of outer urban communities will be heard going forward. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Ms. Ramsey? Uh, seeing none, I just uh, thank you for your, your time today and your correspondence. Pleasure. Thanks. Oh. Oh, Councillor McKinney, is that for, that's for, okay, no, no worries. We're all good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I hand came up at the last minute, but it's, it's for staff. That's very good. Thank you, Chair Moffat. Thank you. Um, so I will just ask uh, Martha, if you could just, I mean, we're here today to talk about the administrative updates. We're not here um, to reconsider the tree protection bylaw. That's, that's clear. Uh, we, we approved that uh, unanimously last, um, last January, all of council uh, after much uh, consideration and much discussion throughout many stakeholders and as Ms. Ramsey um, alludes to the work of cafes and of course um, all the hard work of volunteers there but Martha could you just touch on exactly what's being um, uh, referred to right now and then the, the rationale for why the report is the way it is and why the protection bylaw is the way it is absolutely thanks chair Moffat um, I'll just make one sort of statement is that we we there is no, staff is not um, proposing to decrease the compensation measures for the trees in Canada. So the compensation um, will stay as approved for tree, for distinctive trees 50 centimeters or greater at three to one. So just want to state that clearly that that will stay as is. Um, and, and basically, we, as I said in my sort of preamble, we were looking at what the major issue was for Ottawa right now in terms of tree loss. And the major issue that we've, we've been seeing over the past many years is tree loss due to infill development. And so we were working to solve that problem as a part of this tree bylaw review. And, um, and that is happening in the inner urban area. There is some infill development for sure that happens in, in, the, in the suburban area. Um, and our processes that we have in place will be employed to, to go through those, those infill development reviews as necessary. Um, but we saw that the big problem was in the inner urban area and we saw this decrease in diameter, which of course, as I said before, is a big move. It's a big change for Ottawa. Um, we saw it as being the key item to being able to protect more trees in those infill development scenarios. And that's why we focused it here in the, or here, I'm in the inner urban area, I'm right in the middle of the city, but here to, um, to, to solve that problem uh, as a starting point. And it may be something that we can consider moving forward, but as a starting point, we've start, we're focused on the inner urban area for that tree decrease. So I hope that helps to clarify a little bit. It does certainly. I think we know. I mean, obviously, we we heard the challenges. I know the, the councillors in the core of Ottawa. They they see it. They live it every day. They walk by it. They uh, they see the challenge that we had uh, with the previous bylaw and why we're here today. And I know the mayor too uh, was quite um, steadfast on his desire to see this updated bylaw and better protection of trees where we're losing trees, uh, which is with infill in those urban wards. Um, we are not seeing that level of infill outside of that outside of that urban core. In fact, in rural Ottawa, we don't even have a tree bylaw and we don't, we don't have, uh, we don't have challenges and issues with that um, at all. There is nothing there really that necessitates the requirement for a tree bylaw in rural Ottawa. Um, but there's no question that what we're doing here today is required. Um, and the, I think the only people that oppose it in the urban area are, you know, the people that want to cut down trees and not pay for them. Um, so with that, so just to go to our members of, of committee and Catherine McKinney, Councillor. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Martha, um, for for this. Um, I just want to share a story. Actually, it was Martha who reminded me when this motion passed a few months ago that it had actually been, and this, I find this fascinating. 
it had actually been 11 years to the day uh, when uh, council dealt with um, the urban tree uh, conservation bylaw. And at the time it was, and I do remember it being highly controversial. Uh, I was on staff at the time. I was, uh, I was working uh, at the city and um, staff were to bring forward a policy that did not require any additional resources. And uh, initially it was set at 70 plus centimeters, 70, and it was controversial. Um, it was actually my predecessor at Councillor Holmes uh, who uh, moved a motion to make it 30, that failed miserably. And then 40, she didn't give up, that failed. And because of who she was, uh, she kept pushing and, and uh, had a 50 plus centimeter diameter um, approved for a distinctive tree. Um, and even with that, um, you know, we've seen over the last, uh, well, 11 years and more, uh, but it, it is happening more and more, um, the loss of trees in, in the urban area. It, it really is, it's alarming. And, uh, and while I agree that trees everywhere in the city uh, need to be protected, um, the, the alarming loss really is, uh, is in our urban areas and, uh, and we are, we're seeing it uh, every day. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, with staff, Martha, um, I thank the chair for outlining, you know, the, you know, the fact that we do lose trees uh, in the urban area as a, as a result of, um, of infill development, but in the suburban areas, my understanding then is that the loss of trees uh, is through um, plans of subdivision, uh, site plan and, and uh, development applications. Um, could you just explain, is that, is that so? And what are you doing today and is it working? Thanks so much, Councillor McKenney. And I like that little factoid about the 11 year <laughs> anniversary as well. Um, so yeah, basically what, uh, what we have, so mo most of the development that we see in that suburban area ends up coming through site plans and plans of subdivision. And those are obviously bigger planning act applications. And um, what we've had in place since 2009, since the, the initial urban tree conservation bylaw came into effect is that we have, um, um, a set of requirements for, uh, for, for those bigger properties where you cannot remove a tree and, and, um, unless you have a tree permit, a tree that's 10 centimeters in diameter or greater. So a 10 centimeter tree is very small. So it's pretty much every tree on the site. Um, and when the site plan and plan of subdivision applications are submitted, there's a required tree conservation report to be submitted with those applications. The tree conservation report guidelines are actually included within the tree bylaw. So they're in this, this new tree bylaw as well. And the process is a, is a well integrated process into the development review um, uh, system or whatever. And so uh, in order for a, a, um, an application to be deemed complete and to be circulated out to uh, staff and, and counselors and such, um, it has to have a tree conservation report and a landscape plan. So the tree conservation report looks at the trees that are on the site currently, what the, and it does an inventory of what's on the site. It looks at what's proposed for development and what trees are gonna to need to be removed for that development and what trees are going to be protected as a part of that development. And then the landscape plan, of course, takes a look at what is going to be planted in sort of like to landscape the, the site for the future. And those landscape plans are also looking at how they're compensating for the loss of trees that we would have seen as a result of doing the development. So of course, in those scenarios, trees are lost for sure. So development and trees have an inherent conflict. So we all have to sort of recognize that and know that if we're moving forward with any development, we are likely going to see the loss of trees. It would be a very unique site where there would be no loss of trees. But we do have these processes in place so that the city can be involved because of course before the bylaw went into effect back in 2009 what would happen is folks would come in and say oh there's no trees on the site we could see from aerial photos or from knowledge that there were trees on the site five days ago but now they're gone you know and now we don't have that case we have an opportunity for our experts at the city to weigh in on what's happening on the site from an environmental perspective and from a planning perspective 
our uh, infill, or sorry, our forester, planning forester, uh, Mark Richardson is integrated uh, right into the development review teams. And um, what he does when he's reviewing these applications is he's looking for opportunities for more tree retention and making suggestions to, um, to the applicants and to the planners on the file on how we can retain more trees on site. That's sort of the main, the main role there. And then of course, he's also issuing permits for the trees that do have to be removed. He's doing site visits to make sure that fencing's set up to protect the trees that are being retained, those kinds of things. So, so that's sort of our process for the suburban type development. And, and that's most of the development that we're seeing coming forward is in the suburbs, it's that kind of process. And we feel it's a longer process, it's a more detailed process, and we feel that we have good oversight on what's happening there. But I will also say that that sort of like culture change that we've been talking a lot about of, of better valuing trees and better understanding why uh, the role trees play in cities and stuff, that isn't just for infill development. That also spans over into these other kinds of developments and into the suburbs and, you know, really everywhere. And I think that we are generally seeing, um, and we will moving forward because we can continue to push for this, to see more tree retention, more efforts for tree retention in those bigger development scenarios as well. Although we do feel it's working quite well now, the, just to say the culture change thing spans the whole, everything really. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, actually, just one more little quick um, looking back. I actually worked for Councillor Munter, uh, Alex Munter, when he was Councillor for both Canada North and South. And, and I remember how the Urban Tree Conservation Bylaw came into effect. It was actually a developer, I won't name them, it's a long time ago, um, leave it in the past, but uh, came in and, and raised uh, several hectares of, uh, of um, uh, woodland um, in around the South March Highlands area. I'm sure Councillor Suds is, is well aware of it. And, uh, and we did, we just, you know, it was, it was just clear cut uh, in half a day uh, to the absolute alarm of uh, certainly nearby residents, but, but the city as a whole. So again, you know, the, just the history of how these things come uh, into being and into play and while we have to continually update I think it's it's always important to remember why we have um, our policies and our bylaws and these rules in place um, uh, to begin with and 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 why they're uh, effective and uh, and I agree with you that uh, what we have in place in the outer areas is today um, effective so thank you I appreciate it thank you uh, thank you chair thank you councillor and thank you for your uh, determination as well. I know you, you referenced uh, Councillor Holmes's determination, but also uh, also yours in getting us uh, here and making sure that we're we're on track with this with this implementation of this bylaw. Uh, Councillor Cloutier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, and Martha, thank you very much for your hard work in for several several years on on this and and on our uh, on our tree bylaws. We appreciate it very much. Just wanted to check and just if the chair could indulge me for, for a moment, because not specifically with this report, but just it, it, it touches on the report. It's, it's, it's coming into force on January 1st. What can residents expect with respect to the implementation for development applications that have been approved or that are in the process for approval? And, and just how, can, how will we as councillors and residents be able to tell which applications this new bylaw will be applied to after uh, January 1st. I guess yeah, that's that, for Martha. Yeah, thank you so much, Councillor Cloutier. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it's pretty simple. Basically any applications that come in before January 1st, it would be the for applicants for a tree permit that come in before January 1st, it would be our old rules that apply. And anything that comes in after January 1st, our new rules would apply. So I know that it could get kind of complicated if you have say, like um, like a building permit application that's sp spanning the two. Um, if, the, if the tree information was submitted to forestry before January 1st, then it would be the old, like the current requirements that apply. And if the tree information is submitted after January 1st for, for that tree permit, it would be the new ones that apply. And of course, for the site plans and plans that like the bigger application development applications, um, there is no change. So it, it, it will apply the same way. 
So we'll just use that as a hard line. Thank, thank you, Martha. And thank you again for your hard work for our community. Thank you, Chair, who is absent. There he is. Perfect timing. Uh, thank you. Um, so seeing no more questions. Uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you, staff. Um, other staff, not just Martha, but there's other people too. Uh, thank you, members of committee. So let me just bring it open. Just give me a sec. I had something else open for a second here. So the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend that Council, one, approve the amendments to the Tree Protection Bylaw as described in the report, two, approve the amendments to the Planning Fees Bylaw 2015-96 as described in this report, and three, delegate the authority to the General Manager of Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development, and the City Solicitor to make the amendments described in this report and to bring forward the bylaws to Council for enactment. Is that item carried? Thank you very much. So I, uh, I have an item of seven. Uh, it wasn't on the agenda, but I have an item seven to add. It's, um, let me just give me a sec here. It's a timing matter reg regarding a uh, getting back to the province on blue box regulations, on the draft regulations. So um, I'll get Councillor Mar Menard to read the motion. I'm just going to quickly do the that the same committee on environment protection water and waste management suspend the rules of procedure pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw being bylaw uh, 2019-8 to permit the introduction of the following motion given the requirement to submit comments to the ministry of environment conservation and parks uh, by december 3rd 2020 which would require this matter to be considered by council at its next meeting on november 25th 2020 um, can we waive the rules to add Thanks. And Councilor Bernard, I'll ask you to uh, to read the motion that's on the screen. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got it here uh, separately. It might be easier for me here. So, whereas the City of Ottawa is required um, under Regulation 10194, Recycling and Composting of Municipal Waste, to establish, operate, and maintain a blue box waste management system with the materials to be managed identified in Schedule 1, Blue Box Waste of the Regulation. And whereas the city of Ottawa currently provides residents with these recycling services through its dual stream blue box, glass, metal, plastics, and black box, cardboard and fibers programs. And whereas despite offering two streams for collection, the term blue box is herein intended to reflect the materials outlined in the regulation, which are collected through both streams. And whereas the blue box program is currently overseen by Stewardship Ontario a not-for-profit industry funded organization, which collects fees from brand owners first importers or franchisors to help municipalities offset some of the costs of delivering recycling services. And whereas in 2016, the province of Ontario introduced the Waste Free Ontario Act 2016, which provides the regulatory direction for the restructuring of the province's diversion policies from a product stewardship model to an individual producer responsibility model in support of the province's shift towards developing a circular economy. <clears throat> Whereas on June 7, 2019, the Government of Ontario assigned a special advisor on recycling and plastic waste to develop a report guided by a number of policy objectives, including to improve Ontario's blue box program by requiring producers to pay for the recycling of the products they produce through achieving producer responsibility, with the product being issued on July 20, 2019. <clears throat> and whereas based on the recommendations of the report, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change issued a direction to Stewardship Ontario to develop a funding plan for that would, would allow for the transition of the blue box program to full producer responsibility under the oversight of the newly formed resource productivity and recovery authority rpra between january 1st 2023 and december 31st 2025 whereas after extensive consultation with stakeholders the ministry issued the draft regulations to make producers responsible for operating blue box programs on october 19th 2020 with the comment period ending on december 3rd 2020 and whereas city staff have reviewed the draft regulations and are preparing briefings with members of council over the coming weeks, including anticipated impacts to Ottawa residents and to the city's operations and what is known and unknown at this point with the aim of answering any questions council may have, as well as consolidating a list of comments and our outstanding questions for both from both council and city staff as a subject matter experts. And whereas the time between the release of the draft regulations and the due date for comments will not allow city staff adequate time to repair and submit draft comments for committee and council approval before submitting to the province by their deadline. Therefore, be it resolved that council delegate authority to the general manager of public works and environmental services 
to work with the Solid Waste Master Plan Council Sponsors Group to prepare and finalize comments on the draft blue box regulations on behalf of the City of Ottawa and be it further resolved that City staff be directed to provide Council with a copy of the comments submitted to the province and provide an update to committee and Council to highlight any notable changes between the draft regulations and final regulations once they are registered in late 2020 or early 2021. Back to you, Chair. All right, uh, thank you for that. So as you see in the motion, it, 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 it asks uh, direct staff to work with the sponsors group. That is uh, myself as chair, um, Sean Menard as, as vice chair, as well as uh, regional representatives on council, uh, Councillor El Shantiri and Councillor Dudas. Um, they've been working with us on the, on the, the SolidWorks master plan um, development and in that, in that sponsors group. So this would bring us back to, uh, to that group. I don't know if we have, uh, let me just get my screen back. Can you just pull this off the screen so I can see the rest of the. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if we have any, if anyone has any questions on this. Um, we do have, I think we have staff here. Just trying to see. Yeah, Nicole Hoover, um, Vinash is here. Uh, if you have any questions um, on this, I mean, this has been ongoing for quite some time. Um, I think Ottawa is in a pretty good spot when it comes to how we manage our, our blue box uh, program. And we expect that what happens across the province won't be overly dissimilar uh, to how we operate ours. Uh, what, what it comes down to is how, how it's paid for and who's collecting and how that's going to work. Uh, there are still some questions that remain um, unanswered. And uh, Nicole has sort of that broken down and um, can provide those comments and what we know, we don't know uh, to members of council. So I'm going to just call just if you want to have a few comments before we vote on the matter. Sure thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as um, the ch chair had commented, um, the intent of this process is really uh, due to the fact that we have uh, tight timelines between the release of the draft uh, regulations and that requirement to submit those comments on behalf of the city. Um, so set, staff has set up six briefing sessions for members of committee and council. Um, as well as for um, members of council staff over the next week. So beginning this Friday, taking place until next Thursday, which to date we have the majority of members of council who have registered. Um, and as part of those sessions, we will provide, as the chair mentioned, a detailed briefing on the expected impacts to residents, city operations, an overview of what we know, what we still don't know about the transition, as well as a high level overview of the key considerations and key decisions that council will have to be making over the coming months as well as an overview of the work that staff is currently undertaking to help prepare council to make these key decisions. Um, and as uh, the motion had highlighted, of course, the feedback um, from these briefing sessions, uh, the feedback we received from members of council will make sure are incorporated um, in the city's comments that will be provided back to the ministry. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for your for your work on this. I know it's been a long, um, you know, just in addition to everything the province is doing and what we have to respond to and development of our solid waste master plan. I know it's been a lot of, a lot of work on, with your group. Um, so I see no questions for, for you. So, um, on the motion, can we approve that motion? Approved. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Gary. All right. So that was officially our last item. Uh, item seven, uh, in-camera items, there are none. Uh, notice of motion for consideration sub subsequent meeting. I don't believe I received any notice of motion. So I have none, so no. Inquiries, none. Uh, other business, none. Adjournments, carried. Our next meeting is Tuesday, December 15th. Just of note, we will likely only have one item at that committee. Um, it's likely to be the update on the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which we promised annually um, I think it's important to hold that meeting, to do that update, because that is exactly what we committed uh, to doing uh, to our uh, to our residents. So we'll, we'll have that meeting and we'll go from there. Um, there will be a climate change uh, master plan update as well, subsequent to that, but it'll likely be in February. Uh, so on that, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you when you see you.